I would like to first take this opportunity to talk about Boss Bumble and how we came together and how this event here is happening today, like the chain of events that led today. Um, as you might have heard, um, Gezi protests in Turkey last summer. Um, it was an opportunity for us here for um, Tur uh, Turkish people or people from Turkey or who, people who care about Turkey to come together and uh, do their part as a motivation to do their part about uh, what's going on in Turkey. And that brought us together and then we sort of decided to contribute to the political and social debate that is going on, that takes place in Turkey in a more or less closed form, you know, that uh, in a while in uh, the public debate is like a recycling of discourses. So we decided to do our part to, you know, as much as we can in, uh, in forms of panels or movie screenings or just weekly or bi-weekly forums. And um, this January, as again, you probably have heard of it, and you can see um, the name here, Rantik was an um, Armenian journalist from Turkey, and he was assassinated, unfortunately. And the commemoration for Rantik um, led to this, uh, we realized that this, there, as Boston would, um, we decided to um, make a common um, commemoration service and then we joined, I think it was with Harry and we communicated. And then at this commemoration, it, it started an interaction and which we hope that it's going to be the first of a continuous dialogue in between these communities because the problem, not the problem, but it's, we, um, how, how shall I put this? We live in a bubble that either we create or others have created for us in terms of information and knowledge. And th there, are, there should be opportunities for us to listen, to learn, to understand, to talk. And sometimes these stories, the, the, this gets lost in the, this cannot penetrate them both. And, um, even though the stories that we think we know closely, that we relate to closely, that we live in, uh, might have layers that we are not aware of. And to go back to the beginning of what I said, the Gezi protests, um, the Gezi part was previously an Armenian cemetery, Surpao Armenian cemetery, and the, the uh, tombstones in that cemetery were used while building the park. So it's like when people protested there, they were actually protesting on history, but they were not aware of that. And when, while reporting about these protests, this cemetery, the Armenian cemetery, was just a footnote in the main narrative, or like a picture of North Zartong. A, um, an organization was there, and they set up a symbolic cemetery there. And and this symbolic cemetery was just a picture in the news, just to maybe to say that, oh, Armenians were there too, they were at Gezi too, but not without the proper context. So what I'm trying to say is, um, these stories that we think we are part of, we are living, sometimes have many layers that we are not aware of. So I think events like this present us the opportunity to to reiterate myself, to listen, to learn, to understand and talk and hear what the other side has to say or what others that we have not interacted with previously have to say. So our speakers are going to tell their stories or give us what they know, their information about what we might not know. And please do not hesitate to ask questions uh, after all the speakers are done with their stories, but also keep this Keep this frame, this picture, this what we know and we might not know in mind while asking your questions. So without further ado, and I think I spoke more than I should, I would like to present our first speaker, Dwight Kurt. He is a PhD candidate at Clark University and he is working his various research on Aintap or Antep um, Armenians uh, who lived there between 1915 and 1921. And he is going to talk about what happened on this, uh, as you can see in the title, what happened on this day and before or after. So, Fidoja, thank you very much. Thank you so much for all of you here. Uh, I'm so happy to be 
here actually and thank you for the invitation uh, by the uh, Association organization. Um, I would like to um, talk about, I would like to give you a, a general, very general uh, summary or general information, the background information and contextual information with respect to the, uh, what happened on uh, 20, 24th April 1915. Actually, it was just only a moment, only a particular kind of incident which took place in this particular time period, in this particular day. But of course, we had a history before, uh, before I mean, this 24th of April 1915. Uh, the total um, destruction of the Armenians marked the fact that a government that tried to eliminate a particular group of its own citizens in an effort to settle the perceived political problem. Between 1895 and 1922, Ottoman Armenians suffered massive loss of life and property as a result of pogroms, massacres, and other forms of mass violence. The 1915 Armenian genocide can be seen as the pinnacle of this process of decline and the destruction. It consists of a series of genocidal strategies, the mass executions of elites, which exactly took place on 24th of April 1915, not only in, Bolivia, in Istanbul, actually all over Anatolia, categorical deportation, which started off in February and March uh, within the Cilicia region, forced assimilation, destruction of material culture, and the collective disposition, which means the confiscation and the plunder of Armenian movable and immovable properties within the framework of so-called abandoned properties law. Armenians all over the world commemorate this great tragedy, genocide, on April 24, because it was on that day in 1915 when more than 250 Ottoman, uh, uh, Ottoman citizens, Armenians, intellectuals, writers, doctors, pharmacists, thinkers, professionals in various kinds in Constantinople, present-day Istanbul. They were rounded up, deported, and many of them were killed during their, uh, their, their way to Chankara and Ayş. <coughs> Part of them were put in prison in Chankara, either Chankara or Ayş, and then they were waiting for actually being, being sent uh, off to Syrian region, Syria. was masterminded by the Central Committee of the Young Turk Party, Union and Progress Party, Tate Teraki Umumi Merkezi, the Committee of the Union and Progress Party, which was dominated by Talat Pasha, Emel Pasha, and Cemal Pasha. They were an ultra-nationalist Turkish nationalist group whose ideology was articulated by Ziya Gökhan, Dr. Nazım, and Bahattin Şahit. Dr. Nazım and Bahattin Şakir were two guys who actually organized and, and, and who were in the field. These two doctors, physicians. The Armenian genocide was directed by a special organization which was called Teşkilat-ı Mahsusa, set up by the Committee of Union and Progress by Bahattin Şakir and Dr. Nazım themselves, which created special butcher battalions made up of violent criminals released from prison. Some righteous Ottoman officials, such as Celal Bey, governor of Aleppo, Masar Bey, governor of Ankara, and Reşit, governor of Kastamonu, and the, uh, the Kaimakam, sub-governor of Lice, they were dismissed for not complying with the extermination campaign. Any common Turks who protected Armenians were also punished. The Armenian genocide occurred in a systemic fashion, which proves that it was directed by the Union and Progress Party and the Central Committee of the, the same party. First, the Armenians in the army were disarmed, placed into labor battalions, and then killed. Then the Armenian political and intellectual leaders were rounded up on April 24, and then many of them killed. In a memorandum dated on May 26, 1915, the interior minister, Talat Pasha, requested from the Grand Vizier, Said Halim Pasha, at that time, 
the enactment through the cabinet of a special law authorizing deportations. Actually, deportations got started off before this, this, this, this date by Khaled Pasha because of the foreign pressure coming from the Italy, France, and Britain, and Russia. Talat Pasha was trying to legalize the deportation. And Talat Pasha was also trying to make complicit the other guys within the cabinet. A letter to the Minister of Interior from the General Command on 26th of May 1915 states that it was orally decided to Armenians be sent from Eastern Anatolian provinces, from Zeytun, from such areas which are densely populated by Armenians to the south of the province of Diyarbakir, to the valley of the Euphrates, to the vicinity of Urfa and Suleimani. It was the whole deportation road at the very beginning. Consular reports corroborate that when the deportation campaign started in Zeytun in February 1915 and March 1915, the Armenians showed no resistance and followed orders. Even though the official deportation decision was made on 26th of May in 1915, deportations in Zeytun, Zeytun region had already begun in March 1915. And Zeytun, as well as Dörtyol, Alexandre, Iskenderun, uh, uh, Hachin, uh, and so on. Some Armenians in the region refused to join the army and hid in the mountains as a form of passive resistance as uh, to, as, as, as, I mean, as uh, taking place in Zeytun. Finally, the remaining Armenians were called from their homes, told they would be relocated, and then march off to the concentration camps in, this, in the desert between Jarablus and Derzor, where they would starve and thirst to death in the burning sun. On the march, often they would be denied food, water, and many were brutalized and killed by their so-called guards and uh, marauders. The authorities in Trabzon, on the Black Sea coast, did, ver did vary this routine. They did change this routine. They loaded Armenians on barges and sank them out at the sea. The Turkish government today denies that there was, there was an Armenian genocide and claims that Armenians were only removed from the eastern war zone. The Armenian genocide, however, occurred all over Anatolia, and not just so-called in war, war zone. Deportations and killings occurred in the west, in and around Izmit, Bursa, Hüdelvandiya, in the center, in and around Ankara, Ankara, in the southwest and around Konya. Konya, by the way, was the first, uh, I mean, first concentration camp which was decided that Armenian, the deported Armenians were supposed to be relocated in the Konya region, but on 24th of April in 1915, deportation road changed uh, all the way up to Syrian desert. And Adana, uh, which is near Mediterranean Sea, in the central portion of Anatolia, in and around Diyarbakir, Harput, Maraş, Sivas, Şevin Karahisar, and Urfa, and on the Black Sea coast, in and around Trabzon, all of which are not part of a war zone. Only Erzurum, Bitlis, and Van, which constitute the Vilayet and Sitte, these six provinces, in the east were in the war zone. And in these two, two Vilayet, two cities, two, pro, uh, two, uh, two provinces, were evacuated in the late week of June 1915. Because on 21st of June, Talat Pasha sent a telegram which stipulated that all Armenians within these specific provinces were going to send off to Derzor, by, uh, that, uh, sent, sent to Syria, first Aleppo, and then they were going to distribute it to other regions, Resul Ain, Derzor, uh, uh, Meskene, Dara, and so on and so forth. The very nature of the deportation is sufficient evidence of genocidal intent. Where the first anti-Armenian measures did not distinguish innocent individuals from guilty, the new ones did not differentiate between communities with revolutionary traditions or the great majority without, nor between border regions and interior. Unlike the first Dayton deportees, the Armenians were not sent to the places where settlements was possible. If difficulty, they were sent, defenseless, 
and without provision or the means of subsistence to desert regions where natural attrition could take its deadly toll. The Armenian genocide was condemned at the time by the representatives of British, French, Russian, German and Austrian governments, namely all major powers, in May, 20, 23rd of May in 1915. The first three were uh, the force of the Ottoman Empire, the latter two allies of the Ottoman Empire, the United States, the neutral towards the Ottoman Empire, also condemned the Armenian genocide and was the chief spokesman in behalf of the, on behalf of the Armenians. The American people, via local Protestant missionaries, did the most to save the wretched remnants of the dead marchers and the orphaned children. Despite the Turkish denial, there is no doubt about the Armenian genocide. For example, German ambassador Count von, von Wolf Metterny, Turkey's ally in the World War I, wrote his government in 1915 saying, the committee, the Union and Progress Party committee, demands the annihilation of the last remnants of the Armenians and the Ottoman government must bow to its demands. German consul stationed in Turkey, including vice consul Max Irving von Schubert Richter of Erzurum, who was actually uh, Adolf Hitler's chief political advisor in the 1920s, were eyewitnesses. He wrote his own diary, actually, regarding the Erzurum region. Hitler said to his generals on the eve of sending his death hats, units into Poland, go, kill without mercy, who today remembers the annihilation of the Armenians. Henry Morgenthau, the neutral American ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, sent a cable to the U.S. State Department in 1915, called, deportation of and the excesses against peaceful Armenians is increasing, and from harrowing reports of eyewitnesses, it appears that a campaign of race extermination is in progress under a pretext of reprisal against rebellion. The Turkish court itself concluded that, in 1919, the leaders of the Young Turk government were guilty of murder. This fact has been proven and verified. It maintained that the genocidal scheme was carried out with as much as secrecy as possible. That a public facade was maintained of relocating of Armenians. That they carried out the killing by a secret, secret network. That the decision to eradicate the Armenians was not a hasty decision, but the result of extensive and profound, profound deliberation. If you just try to comprehend the, the, the mentality or the, uh, or, or, I mean, or the real intention of the deportation, you can see the genocidal intent actually. Because right after the deportation decision, the Union and Progress Party government promulgated and introduced a large, a large number of abandoned properties laws, and they, try, and they start confiscating Armenian movable and immovable properties for, as regards to mobile properties, they opened auctions and they started selling Armenian properties. <coughs> and they didn't send the value of those properties to the Arme deported Armenians, even though they promised. Enver Pasha, Jamal, Tal Jamal Pasha and Talat Bey and, and Dr. Nazım Bahattin Shakir, the, the, the governor of Diyarbakir, Reşit Bey, they were all convicted by the Turkish court and condemned to death for extermination and destruction of the Armenians. So, uh, actually, I don't want to just get into I mean too, uh, too much details regarding the, uh, the, the whole deportation. Uh, from that point, I just want to uh, share with you my own story regarding how can I just got involved in. Uh, Armenian genocide or the Armenian problem or Armenian question, whatever you term. Uh, now I'm a PhD candidate at Clark University working with Taner Akcan. I am uh, about to uh, write my dissertation. I have been conducting my research in various archives for, for a long while. Uh, I started my PhD in 2010 and but 
the, the, the event or the incident which happened to me uh, occurred in 2006 six, and between these throughout these four years I was just <coughs> reading and studying on Armenian genocide or Armenian deportation from different sources. In 2006 I graduated from Middle East Technical University from the political science and public uh, political science and uh, public administration department and then I just moved back to my hometown by the way I was born in Aintab and I was grown up in Aintab so I was just uh, spending my leisure time in Aintab because of my graduation I was chilling up and a friend of mine just gave me a call uh, we haven't I mean we hadn't seen each other for a long while and then she wanted to meet and then she wanted to have coffee in a coffee shop and she gave me a name of a coffee shop which was called Papyrus, Papyrus Cafe. Uh, and I was not aware of the, this, this, this coffee shop actually, Papyrus Cafe. And I said, where is that place? She said, it's in Kayacik Mahallesi, Kayacik Street, Bey Mahallesi. When you take the bus and when you get off the Kayacik Mahallesi, Kayacik Street, you are gonna, you are gonna get into Bey, Bey Mahallesi and then you will see all this, this coffee shop. It's very famous, what she said. And then I took the bus, I got off just front of the Kayacik Mahallesi, it was a very narrow street. In front of the door, it was saying, Kayacik Mahallesi, welcome to Kayacik And when I just got into the street, it was a very narrow street, and it, and it was surrounded by beautiful houses. They were like mansions. And the architect and the, con and the content and the nature of the houses were distinctly different to me, because I hadn't seen such kind of beautiful and wonderfully constructed houses in my life and I was shocked and I start telling myself how can just <laughs> I tell people manage to build such kind of beautiful houses because I was really amazed I was shocked all houses are full of apartments in Ainta so and then I, I, I just I start getting around those houses and I was just amazed even though I don't just know the art history I'm not very good at art and, and, and, and other thing this this house, this architect even amazed me as well. So after a while, I just uh, I was able to find out the Papyrus Cafe. In front of the Papyrus Cafe, I just picked my head and I saw some letters, which were inscribed on the top of the, on the heel of the door and in uh, the gate. And and the gate was beautifully embellished. It was an amazing amazing gate as well. And I was again shocked. And I just thought those inscriptions, those letters were Ottoman Armenians. By the way, at that time, I was a member of Socialist Party. I was just, uh, I was, I was a guy who was opposed to all nationalist tendencies and inclinations and so on and so forth. I was a socialist guy. Still, I am actually. So, and I thought, as a socialist guy, as an intellectual guy, I thought I had sufficient amount of uh, sufficient I mean a great deal of historical consciousness let's say I got in the house and I saw build beautiful place a large park in the park, park. Uh, park. a large field courtyard. Courtyard. courtyard courtyard it was beautiful and there, there were trees on top of the house and there were two sides of the house one side was separated for the guest, the other side was separated for the whole, uh, the, the whole family within the house. And then I just saw my friend, we had some conversation, I just left her for a while and I start, got, uh, I start getting around the house. And then I saw the same inscriptions within the whole of the house. It was, it reminded me of the cathedral in Florence, the large hill. They were all inscribed and embellished with the letters which I, have, I had just seen in front of the door and I just thought, no, these letters were not, I mean, were not supposed to be Ottoman letters because there were some Christian kind of symbols on the top. And then I just, uh, I wanted to get, get, to get, get, get some information regarding the history of the house. And I found the owner of the house, the guy was having, uh, he, I mean, he was, he was having, having his tea <laughs> and I just went to him, I asked, Salam alaikum alaikum salam. 
it's a very nice sound. So how, how did you get this? And he said, it left uh, from my father. I said, uh, okay, uh, I mean, from him your father just cut this house. He said, I mean, he, he, he just all of a sudden he stopped talking and he kept silent. And it was 10 seconds or afterwards, and then he said, by murmuring, El Milina Ranch. I said, what? El Milina Ranch. They were Armenians here. I said, I couldn't hear you. He said again, El Milina Ranch. They were Armenians living here. I said, so where are they? He said, they all gone. I said, so they all gone, and then they left this house to you. <coughs> or to your father. At that moment, by the way, at, at, at, at this very right moment, I had slight, I had no slight, I mean, no idea regarding the presence of Armenians in my hometown. And I was shocked by hearing that there were Armenians living in Ainta. I had no idea. And from that, that moment, I just told myself, Mal sahibi, mülk sahibi, hani bunun ilk sahibi. The f famous Turkish saying. The, Owner, owner of the property, the owner of the wealth, where is the first owner of the same wealth or the same property? And then I start reading different sources and different readings, and I came to the, that point till now. Thank you so much for your patience. I'd like to thank Umit Hoca for his speech and I think he showed us that how historical narratives uh, can tie into personal stories and how um, if we dig enough like, if, or if that information comes down or if we dig enough then we can find parts that we have not previously heard of. Uh, the second speaker we have today is going to be Jenny Kizlak. Yep. Uh, he calls it, he, he's an activist. But as you know, today is like if you have a blog and you're suddenly an activist. But John uh, John Adi has really uh, has, he's truly an activist and he has some stories to tell us. So thank you, Mitoja, and thank you, John. Uh, and he's going to tell his story in Turkish, and Zeynep is going to translate. <laughs> I thank so, you very much. I thank the uh, organizers very much for this occasion. Uh, uh, my story is that the events of the past few days have been in the world of the people of the world and how they have been in the world of the people of the world. In the past few years, Diyaspora'daki yaşayan Ermenilerin Türkiye'deki e, Türkiye'deki e, insanlar Ermeni konusundaki belleğin de hafızasında nasıl bir yeri var? Onu anlatacağım. Ondan sonra bir diyaspora Ermenisi olarak da Türkiye'deki insanlara diyaspora'daki Ermenilerin e, Türkiye insanı hakkındaki şeyini, düşüncelerini anlatmaya çalışacağım. Uh, my contribution today is going to involve a kind of a twofold um, story. On the one hand, I'm going to try to talk about uh, the, my own, through my own experiences, the impressions of um, Turkish people, uh, the way they think about the Armenian issue. And on the other hand, I'm going to try to talk about how the Armenian diaspora conceives of Turkish people, again, based on my own experiences. Müt arkadaşın çok kısa bir çok güzel bir şekilde özetledi 1930 1915'te neler olduğunu. Ümit has um, uh, very nicely summarized what actually happened in 1915. Ben 1960'lı yılında Kayseri'de doğdum. I was born in Kayseri in 1965. 8 yaşındaydım Kayseri'den İstanbul'a ailemiz göç etti. My family immigrated to Istanbul when I was eight years old. Ee, i̇lk okulu devlet okulunda, or, orta ve liseyi Ermeni okulunda, iki yılda üniversiteye tecrübe var, eğitim konusunda. Uh, I first went to public school and, and primary school, and then I went to the Armenian school for my secondary 
um, school. I went high school and then I went to the university for two years. Yani e, gençlik döneminde siyasi olarak bayağı faal birisiydim, bayağı araştırmacı, okuyan birisiydim. Yani tüm Sovyetler Birliği'nden tutun da tüm e, Çin'den Vietnam'a kadar hepsinin tarihini az çok okuyup öğrendim. Uh, as a young person I was very interested in global affairs. I was an activist and I was very interested in reading and learning about the histories of the world struggles from um, the Soviet Union to China, which is generally interested in global history. Uh, 1990 yılında Amerika'ya green card numaraları göçmen olarak geldim. 24 senedir de burada yaşıyorum. Uh, I came to the United States in 1990. Um, I won a green card through a lottery, and so I've been living here for 24 years now. 14 senelik eğitim, eğitim hayatımda tüm tarih kitaplarından şehide varıncaya kadar o süre içerisinde kitapların hiçbirisinde bir tek Ermeni milleti hakkında tek bir kelime, tek bir deyim duymadım. In my life as a student for 14 years. 14 years. I have never encountered a single word uh, concerning anything regarding Armenian life or presence. Kendi tarihimi öğrenmeye 2002 yılında Amerika'da okuyarak Taner Atcan ve Agos Kastesi'nin sayesinde kendi tarihim hakkında bilgi edinmeye başladım. I started learning about my own history in 2002 through reading uh, works uh, by the likes of Kaner Akçam and um, those publications through Agos uh, uh, daily. And if I was in my life, I would have to know that I would have to know that I would have to know that I would have to know that I would have to know that I would have to know that I would have to know that I would have to know that I would have to know that I Orada var mıyım, yok muyum, varlığından bir haber, haberim yoktu benim. Belki ben bir Ermen olarak kendi kendime şüpheyim dedi ki ben nasıl varım? Bütün insanlar yani ben Ermen olarak kendimi bilmesem Ermeni varlığından haberim yok. Çünkü hiçbir yerde Ermeninin hiçbir şeyi geçmiyor. Ermeni olarak hiçbir yerde e, yazılı bir şey yok. Because there's no, not a single clue about Armenian presence uh, within the Turkish written media, the culture in general. I mean, aside from the fact that I am an Armenian, it was very difficult for me to conceive of how any other person would become aware of Armenian presence. Even I, as an Armenian person, would sometimes be baffled by my own presence. I would think to myself, do I really exist? Where is my existence? Yani bu kadar bellek yoksunu bir e, Ermeni e, Ermeni halka aslında belleğinde olmayan Türkiye insanı Ermeni meselesiyle nasıl tanıştı? Asala olayları ne zaman 1970'te Asala konsolosluklara basmaya şey yaptı? E, tüm Türkiye toplumu bir şok oldu bu Ermeni meselesi nedir? Bu Asala nedir? Yani Ermeni meselesiyle tanışmasına sebep Asala, Asala örgütünün konsolosluklar öldürmesiyle Ermeni konusu konuşulmaya başladı Türkiye'de. In the context of such erasure of memory and presence, the way in which uh, Turkish culture, Turkish media picked up on Armenian presence was through uh, these violent acts of the so-called terrorist organization Asala as if Armenians all of a sudden you know started becoming started existing through these acts. Bunun peşi sırada ülkelerde e, parlamentolarda temsil edilmeye başlayan soykırım yasalarının şey yapması üzerine Ermeni meselesi Türkiye insanının gündemine oturdu. And subsequently there these international affairs debates um, that were revolving around the recognition of the genocide. Um, so, um, yeah, the question of Armenian presence was almost re-imported to Turkey through these international affairs.
Bundan sonraki şeyin Türkiye'deki insanlara 1990 yılında buraya geldiğim zaman kendi gönlüm olarak, istekli olarak ben buraya göçmen olarak geldim ve çalışmaya başladım. Benim buraya yerleşip hayatta tutunabilmem tam 14 senemi aldı kendi şeyimi şey yapabilmek için. When I came here in 1990 and I came here voluntarily, it took me 14 years to uh, be able to stand on my own feet and to be independent, you know, to make a life for myself here. Şimdi şöyle bir düşünün, 1915 yılında yerlerinden, yurtlarından sürülen insanları çöllerden bir yaşam sürerek ne aldı olduklarını? Ben 14 yıl 16 saat çalışarak ancak kendi kendimi hayatlar üzerinde durabildim. İki çocuğum geldiğimde e, e, eşim hamileydi 6 aylık. 14 yıl ben çocukların yüzünü doğru dürüst göremedim. Sabah saat 6.30'da evden çıkıyordum. Gece 11'de evde eve geliyordum ki bu Amerika gibi bir yerde yaşıyorum. Yani bir de e, şey olarak e, o dönemin insanların, o günün şartlarındaki o diasporaya sürülen insanların yaşam şeylerini düşünmeniz açısından söylüyorum bunları. Uh, I will try to set out a comparative framework here. I came here voluntarily and uh, even I, you know, even for me it took 14 years um, to be settled, to feel uh, more freedom to be able to see my kids. When I came here my wife was pregnant um, and for years on end I was working seven hour shifts and I was leaving my home at 6.30 and when I would return my kids would already be asleep. So comparatively to think of people who were forced into migration in 1915, you know, it's a, it's a something to think about. Yani, bunları anlatmaktan sebep, diaspora'ya giden insanların ruh halini anlamamız, onların ne şekilde hayatta tutunduklarını, bütün bu olanlardan sonra devletin, Türkiye devletinin bütün bu olanları yok sayarak inkar etmesinin insanlar üzerindeki etki, e, etkisini görmemiz için şey, e, anlatıyorum. I'm talking about my experiences so that it's it's a comparative case for people who were forced into migration who took up lives in the diaspora while at the same time the Turkish government kept on denying the atrocities. Yani sadece düşünmek ve e, var olan şeyleri göz önünde bulundurduğumuz zaman bunlardan insan olarak ders çıkartma ve gerçekten empati yapmayı öğrenmek. E, bunlar için anlatıyorum ki bilelim belleğimizde nasıl bir yer ediyor. Bir diaspora olarak insanın şeyinde yani var olanları inkar etmek, hiç olmamış gibi kabul etmek. Yani insanın ne duruma düşüyor? Kendi kendime soruyorum. Benim ana dilim nedir şimdi? Yani kim söyleyebilir benim ana dilimin ne olduğunu? Ben kendim ana dilimin ne olduğunu bilmiyorum. Ana dilim Türkçe desem Türk değilim. Dilim Ermeni. Ana dilim Ermenice desem Ermenice bilmiyorum. Ermeniceyi de burada öğrendim. 6 yıl İstanbul'da Ermeni okulunda okumama rağmen Ermeniceyi de burada öğrendim ben. Just it's very, very important to see things as they are and to try and imagine what it must have felt like for those people in the diaspora to continually deal with this denial. As for myself, I I am still baffled. I don't even know what my mother tongue is. I even though I went to Armenian school in Turkey for years, I had to learn Armenian here. Um, I speak Turkish, but then I'm Armenian by um, affiliation. I do not know what my mother tongue is. Thank you very much. Yeah, there is not much else to say about John's speech. And um, if you have any questions for him later, if you can look at any session, you can ask him. Um, our first speaker is going to be Nanor Barsunyak. She 
uh, report she worked for Armenian UK, she reports that she is concerned about human rights and other issues. She has recently been to Turkey and she heard stories that she wouldn't think she would hear. So she's going to share some of those and then she's going to later uh, talk about her experience as well. So thank you, Jen. Well, my story is very different than yours. I, I was born in Beirut. My mother was born in Alexandria, Egypt, and her parents came from Kesaria, or Kayseri, and Adana. My father's side came from Antal. And now I ask questions and tell and edit stories for my job. And the Armenian genocide has been a part of my reality since as long as I can remember. And it's now a significant part of my work. I did not meet a Turk until I came to the United States when I was about 14 years old. It was in high school, and it was orientation, the first day of school. And this girl caught my eye. And I thought at first she might be Armenian. So I approached her and we became friends. Months later, when the topic of the Armenian genocide came up, she told me that she did not believe that it had happened and that her father had told her it was a lie. That was my first case of being faced with genocide denial. I was shocked and I think this wall was suddenly built between us and I couldn't break it down. And if you're in Turkey, 1915 stares at you in the face. It's in the ruins, and it's in the individuals who remain behind. So years after I graduated, I went to Turkey. It was in 2012. That was my first visit. I was hoping to go back soon. And I visited the eastern provinces, which were the millennial home of the Armenian civilization and culture. It was an emotionally taxing journey. I never anticipated it to be so emotional. And I was obsessed in finding Armenian inscriptions and Armenian ruins and churches. We would be driving around in a van and my driver had taught me a few words of Turkish. My favorite word became dur, which means stop. So I would be driving down the street and I would just stare attentively at all the walls and the piles of rocks and I would see something and I would scream, Dur! And he would stop and I would run out of there and inspect the rocks and inspect the walls. Um, and I saw a lot. I saw inscriptions on the sides of houses. I saw cross stones, which are these big uh, stone, huge stones with uh, crosses carved in the front and specific designs. And those were now parts of sidewalks. I saw um, church columns holding the sides of houses up. And when we went into someone's home, I saw these big wooden beams that were holding up the ceiling and they had Armenian inscriptions on them in the year 1895, which was the year that Armenians were killed en masse during the reign of the Red Sultan. Up to but there was something I hadn't anticipated, and it was something that shattered any preconceived notion I had of who an Armenian genocide survivor is. Because our genocide survivors were our grandparents. They were my great aunt who lived to be old enough to tell me some of these stories, and they were the old ladies and old men who would come to the commemoration events and sit in the corner silently. So we were in Elazik, which is near Harper, Harput, and we were walking down this cobblestone street and this old man came out, he was a saddle maker, and he invited us in for tea. We went in, we had our tea and we started chatting. My colleague, Khachik Muradia, who's the editor of our, our, our paper, he was acting as translator. And at one point, the man looked at us and pointed at us all, and he said, 
I am one of you. And he said his mother was Armenian. Now that completely shattered all my thoughts of who this genocide survivor was. Because here was the son of a genocide survivor. And during these two weeks that I was there, we wandered through, through old Armenian villages and streets, and we encountered others whose grandparents, mostly grandmothers, were Armenian. And this is the chapter that has been missing in our narrative. Karam Think for one believed that there are one million Armenians hidden in Turkey, or hidden Armenians in Turkey. And thousands of Armenian women and children were taken from the Armenian community during the genocide. They were Islamized, and now they are there, so their descendants are there. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, my colleague Hachi gave a talk at MIT, and he said something very powerful. He said, just as we are losing our survivors, Turkey is finding its own survivors. <coughs> but these stories aren't just preserved by survivors and their descendants. And here's a story that demonstrates that. We were in Dudan, which is near Diyarbakir. It is where this forge uh, became the grave of 10,000 Armenians who were killed from the town of Chengkush. They were gathered there, and they were bayoneted and thrown down the steep gorge. The story goes that there were so many bodies thrown down there that by the end, a few survivors were able to crawl their, their way up over dead bodies and live to tell of this horror. And so we visited this spot, and there was a Kurdish gentleman who came out of nowhere and greeted us. And we asked him if he knew what this place meant, what, what had happened here. And he said yes, and he told us the same story. And we asked him how he knew of this, and he said that there was a woman in his village who had lived to be 104 years old, who had told them of these <coughs> events. <coughs> then, so we're, we're standing there, and this is the exact same spot, and we're looking down the scourge. Then something really bizarre happened. This man told us that his grandfather had found these items, plates, trays, bowls, from, that, that had been taken from the Armenians, and that the village folk <coughs> believed that these items had once been made of gold. And once they were taken from the Armenians, they had turned into copper. And the belief was, if an Armenian was to read the inscriptions on these items, they would turn <coughs> back to gold. And so the man asked us if we were willing to read the inscriptions <coughs> on these items. And we were very curious, so we said yes, not because we were curious if these are going to turn into gold, but we were curious to see how this story was going to end. And so we followed him up this road, and he took us to this open field, and we waited there for some time. <coughs> and finally, we saw these women and children coming towards us, carrying these big trays and big bowls, silver and copper things. And they brought it to us, and they put it by our feet. And we took them one by one, and we inspected them for any inscriptions. And I can't remember if there were any inscriptions on them or not, but they did not turn back to gold. <coughs> but what this story tells us is that there was this guilt that was passed from generation to generation in the form of this myth. And they believe that because they were not the original owners of these items, they were unable to enjoy them fully. And we published this story in our paper. Now the reason I told you these two stories is because we encountered these within 10 days, just 10 days, and they were all chance encounters. And imagine how many stories are still to be told. And so during that trip, I was at the Derinler Kervansai in Diyarbakir. And I felt moved to write an article. And I had been writing for the Armenian Weekly for years, but 
this was the first time that I felt that I wanted to communicate to a different paper. <coughs> and it was my first time submitting an article to a different paper, and it was the Osvir Haber paper in DR here. And I titled my article, Notes from a Tourist in DR Bekir. And it was my personal plea to the readers to tell their stories, and in it I wrote, I wish these city walls <coughs> would speak. No, I wish you would speak. Tell me what happened here. Tell me what you've heard. And there are questions that need to be vocalized in Turkey, because the questions are there staring us in the face in the forms of the ruins, the inscriptions, and the genocide survivors in Turkey. It all starts with the question of, where are all the Armenians? Today, there is an increasing number of Turkish intellectuals, activists, and journalists who are writing and speaking publicly about the Armenian genocide. Next week, there are going to be a number of genocide commemoration events in Turkey. The recent Gezi protests has demonstrated an increasing willingness by the youth to ask questions and to challenge the state's narrative. And sometimes when I look at these pictures of these protests and these commemoration events, I sometimes find myself looking for a face, for Aisha's face, my friend from high school, and see if maybe she has finally asked that question, maybe she has turned around and faced the truth. Thank you, Nala. Uh, as this go on, I'm lost for words, so I'm just going to cut it short. Next speaker is Vartedi. Um, she is an artist. She was born and uh, she grew up in Istanbul until the age of 16 when she <coughs> came to the States. Uh, she recently had a gallery called Art Yat, is that, am I saying it right? Pedrasana. Uh, Pedrasana, in 2011. Uh, she had two shows there, and um, you can go check it, read about it online, I have interviews, but here's Martini to tell her story. Yes. So much stories, so much to tell, and then you don't want to tell anything. Um, yes, memories. And memories, collective memories, personal memories, memories of emotions. And mine will be just few scenes of my memories of from my childhood. When I first start learning how to read, as any child, you go and read every sign you see in the streets, from the bus, from the bus stop. My first encounter, when I was like six years old, and I'm learning Turkish, and I'm reading proudly, and I see this writing saying, Vatandaş, Türkçe Polish, citizens speak Turkish. I'm asking my mother, what does this mean? Why, why? She says, Varteni, we told you, don't speak Armenian so loudly in the streets. And don't call me mama. You call everywhere mama, say Anne. So my dichotomy my, uh, uh, started. At home, we are different. Outside, we are different. So this is how. Uh, and then uh, I remember I was very fond of my grandmother, who was also a survivor of Armenian genocide. She was from Bafra. Um, and uh, I have many stories with family, but uh, she always, uh, she was the most vocal one. So, and then um, it was 21st of April, uh, we go to Balukla uh, Cemetery. So, um, and then we are in, and 23rd of April is the most colorful, beautiful holiday for children in whole Turkey. We loved it. So 24th of April I go with my grandmother, you host the old people in front of an obelisk, uh, an anonymous uh, cemetery, doesn't even look like cemetery, it's an obelisk, with plenty of names, and I'm starting to read these names in Armenian, Turkish uh, uh, alphabets, and uh, I asked my grandmother, whose cemetery is this? 
she says this is our martyrs who didn't have any burial, who couldn't be buried. So it's for them. It's, it's many people. So I started questioning. I came home, started asking, and then they told her that she's talking too much to me, etc. And um, so Armenian uh, being free uh, in my uh, neighborhood was actually it was a very free neighborhood because it was one of the ancient town uh, in the city called Gedikpasha. It was mostly Armenians, just few Greek houses there, and few Turkish friends we had there. So it was very free. Uh, and, and our identity were mostly free identity were based on Jesus Christ or church. We had colorful eggs for Easter or we had uh, uh, we had Parigenthan, uh, uh, which is the carnival in February, which is another meaning, but we did this. And then we had uh, uh, Christmas. So those were our holidays, and, but the language or our history were uh, uh, actually uh, not free to know or was erased. We, we, we didn't have history. It was just personal history. I learned later that my grandmother's uncle, who was a judge, was taken from 24th April. I learned later my father, who was a mute, he didn't, he didn't want to communicate this subject whether with Armenians nor with Turks, whose uncle was an Oxford graduate, 1891, comes to Istanbul, is one of the founders of Gedeonagal Lisesi, and does reforms in science and arts and literature, and then runs to England and writes his uh, old atrocities. In the, it is today a Haratumos Dichian in British Blue Book and then changes all his identity, everything, again another taboo relative in the house that we cannot talk about. So I graduate from Armenian elementary school in Gelik Pasha and we move on to another neighborhood which I never liked it, but anyway, because Gelik Pasha was the most colorful place with the people who were poor in wealth, but so soulful and so full in their, they were all Anatolian Armenians who came and most of them didn't speak Armenian like him. Uh, they spoke Turkish, but some grandmothers spoke like from Arabkir or Malatya or Evere. Those were villages, small villages. They spoke dialect of Armenian, which I loved it. They used to uh, weave uh, these rugs, colorful rugs and everything. So I went to Austrian gymnasium uh, uh, uh, in uh, St. Georg, it's called. First two years we learned the language. Uh, in uh, middle school we have uh, history, Turkish history. I go through the book everywhere. I don't see anything about Armenian like he says. At the end of the book, Armenians are traitors, they uh, resisted Tashtag and Hunchak party, they rose up and they backstabbed Turkish government, so we were traitors. My grandfather says he was born in Kayseri, my grandmother talks about Malfra, Samsung, the uncle from uh, England, uh, uh, oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. It's, it's, it's all debilitated. So, I'm going to come to the States, to Boston, 1969. I, because I'm a Turkish citizen, I have to take Turkish history, Turkish language, and Yurtash, the civics, and uh, geography. I am in the uh, classroom, and it's all essay questions. We have to write essays. So in Turkish uh, uh, history, uh, this is for diploma, finishing middle school. Uh, I'm looking, I'm looking these questions, I'm saying, no, I'm not going to take this. I'm not going to write anymore, any more, no more hodgepodge. I'm 16 years old. I go to, to the teacher. I tell her, where are give me zero, where Armenians ghosts in this country. So, very triumphant with because all of these years, I wanted to talk, but everybody was saying, no, no, no, no, no, only church, that's it. So, and I have very good Turkish friends. Even in, in the Aussie gymnasium, my blood sister is Turkish. We only talk privately, but never in the streets, nothing. So, 
I walk out of the classroom. Uh, everybody turns. They didn't hear because I just talked to Ferry Hanhan, an art teacher. So, and then, uh, either it was Ferry or Papi, so I don't remember that. So, uh, and then I go to uh, my school and ask for my transcript. Saleh Balkan, the assistant director, and the history teacher was, happened to be next to her too. So I asked to have my transcripts. On the base of 10, my tariff was 2. So they said, Vartini, if you were going to America, why didn't you tell us? We would have given you a passing grade. Why you go without your diploma and two in your eye? I looked, I said, I think they're going to look at my uh, physics, chemistry, other subjects. I don't think they will care much about Turkish history. She was like flabbergasted. Of course, I'm very brave because I'm coming here. Otherwise, they would give me hard time, I know, which I encountered before in school. That's why it came to that momentum that I had to do all this. So I told this story when Hassan Jamal was here, who wrote in many of his articles this, without mentioning my name, where Armenians ghost, where uh, Kurds ghost, where Assyrians ghost, where uh, Greeks ghost, all, all the ghosts. Uh, we have the amalgam of ghosts in Anatolia. So I come here and in high school, uh, the uh, uh, guidance counselor looks and he says, well, your math is nine, your physics is eight, chemistry is seven, how come there is two? What is this? Well, I'm Armenian. And this is Turkish history and I refuse to take my test and this is it. So this was my protest in my way. And uh, so many hist uh, stories, but another time. But 40 years later I go, I, for a long time I tried, um, I am also uh, very, uh, I considered actually from Turkey start reading Marxist books. I was 15 when I read Communist Manifesto. I didn't belong to any party because as an Armenian you are scared to belong to anywhere. It's just private, your own philosophy, nothing political. So, uh, uh, well, I, uh, uh, I tried, uh, I, I, I decided that, I mean, not decided, but I'm, I'm always, uh, uh, the affinity for me is arts and my soul, and I believe that art converges people and nationalism diverges people. But we have to, uh, in order to be an artist, you have to have truly your identity. And it's not only one identity, we have many identities. I'm a mother as an identity, I'm an Armenian. I'm, but the more they try to smother my identity or eradicate my identity, the more I start saying, okay, I want to learn more Armenian, I want to learn this the, uh, poet, that poet, uh, and, and, and it became. And some of our relatives were very humiliated. They were ashamed to be a, a sheep and be murdered of their families. So they, uh, they forget their identity and they took new identity in this country and they, were, uh, they cut the yarn off and became, and inside them they have this strong pain maybe or what, I don't know. But so uh, for 40 years later, 2011, I go to Istanbul. And before that, my mother passed away, and somehow I wanted to reconnect with my history. And my history is mostly, actually, yes, my parents, my grandparents, uh, I have history from Kayseri, from Bafra, but uh, they left early, and my father's side left much earlier, a uh, few uh, centuries before. So Istanbul was, for me, this, this separate entity from everything else. And I think many Istanbulians also felt that way, probably. But uh, uh, I went and I was, uh, uh, before that also I went to Anatolia, as she said, I met uh, many, uh, many, many people. And in Kars I see, uh, uh, they say Russian houses, and it's all written Armenian. I asked the guy, can you read Armenian? He says, no, let me read to you. And I read, and he says, oh, you're Armenian. And blah, blah, blah. We have many stories like this. But the, the palimpsest, the whole thing for me is palimpsest. And Istanbul is a palimpsest. 
Palimpsest is something that you write on parchment papers and the paper was expensive and you erase it and you write again. And no matter how much you want to erase, it's not going to be erased. Always it presence sometimes. Sometimes in such an emotional and beautiful way, it's going to come out. And this is April 24 for me. Yeah? I Thank you, Arthur. I know it was emotional, but thank you. And our, our last speaker is Harry, who is the only uh, speaker here today who was born in America, in the United States. He's a businessman, and he travels a lot. He actually climbed Mount Ararat, or Arada. Um, he ran in 20 Boston marathons. I haven't run in one so far. <laughs> and he biked from LA to Boston. Again. And uh, I bike every day time in Smegana. <laughs> this, this, is, this is a guy. He's been to Turkey many times. He's been to villages of his relatives. So as his brief um, CV uh, says, he has a lot to tell us. So there he is. The floor is all here. Thank you. Thank you, Mura. Uh, thank you very much, fellas. I'm very honored to be here to speak to this uh, Boston Bull group. Um, can I stand because I think Audio and Lexa can start stretching because of the back there, so I'll stand if you don't mind. Um, I've been to Turkey many, many times. I've been to Armenia many times also. I have uh, a good time now when I go to Turkey. I spend more time in Turkey than I do in Armenia. I don't go to Armenia now. Turkey, to me, I feel very comfortable in. I have a lot of good friends in Turkey now. Uh, I. The, the, the, I'm the president of Friends of Frank Dink, and her aunt I have met one time. That was in September when I was there. And this was just before he got killed in January. I felt honored to have met her aunt because her aunt, to me, it was a human rights activist. I'm a human rights activist. I feel the very thing about uh, human rights in America. I start off with the American Indian in America. Okay? I start off with the American Indian, and then I go off from there. Because if you defend the rights of the American Indian, you're defending the rights of everybody else above that. So to me, that's very, very important. And when Herat, when I found out about Herat, uh, I don't know whether it's Uber Gorchek or Tanarakchev who gave me the introduction to Herat. Uh, I said, wow, wait, you know, he's a handsome guy, number one. And he was just such a beautiful person insofar as human rights are concerned for all Turkish citizens, not Armenians only, for all Turkish citizens. And from what my Turkish friends tell me, Herat is the one who kind of opened the door, opened the door for Turkish society to vet their human rights uh, aspects about what Turkish society should be like. And I just felt very honored to, you know, have met this guy, the presence of him. I, I'm very honored to be in this, this place, which is the Mandela Room. And I put uh, Haran Dink in the same aspect of uh, Mandela, as he's the Gandhi of Turkey. He's also the Martin Luther King, and I feel, of Turkey as well. These are human rights people who put their lives out on the line, okay? And Haran knew that what he was getting involved in but once people like that have a commitment to them, it's go. You know, it's go. They, they might, their lives might be threatened and so forth, but their job, their, their, their, their go is more important than just their personal safety. Uh, he had been threatened many times, and I heard recently that he was someplace uh, with his Turkish buddy and they were going to go speak, and they found out there were a bunch of nationalists in the group that they were going to be speaking to. So as it so turned out, so, as it so turned out, by the time Harap had finished speaking, the group had come to understand his point of view, which I think was just wonderful. Harap had that ability. Harap has always said dialogue is the thing that they're looking for, okay? We need dialogue. Harap said, don't blame the Turks because they don't know their own history, just as these folks have said, you know, we don't know our own history. And so how can you blame Turkish people until they know? There's nothing written in the books there. I feel as if there's two things that has to be changed in Turkish society. 
do what we can about that. And that's the educational system. Because there's nothing there in the books that says anything about everybody's a Turk. Okay? I have a friend in Dice City, and uh, he doesn't speak English, and my Turkish book up everything down. So. <laughs> we have a great time together. We have a great time together. Because he knows the history of what happened at Dice City. Okay? So that uh, uh, we, when we sing together, we sing good Turkish songs. I know, you know I sing good Turkish songs. If you want, I'll sing later on. <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, uh, Hussein, they call him now because I've sent people over there, Armenians, who have parents who are from the Gaiseri area, Gaiseri area, and he takes them to their parents' villages and uh, you know, the street. It's difficult to get the house. Because in the old days, evidently, there weren't numbers on the houses, okay? But the streets were there. Like, I went to my mother's village, and, you know, before my mother had passed away, and her girlfriend said, uh, your mother lived on Demir Chilich at Desi. So, you know, I went into the, my mother's village, the Efkere, Bel Desi Balala, or Balala, or something like that. I don't understand all the stuff, but I've heard it. And so it said, Demir Chilich at Desi. I said, wow, wait, this is the street that my mother grew up on. And, and, uh, and then uh, the more I understood, and there was the thing there, the fountain, Sheshna, Sheshna, I think it's called Sheshna or Dutter. And I said, oh my God, my mother got water from this fountain over here. Uh, I don't know what they do. They break the thing, there's a big round stone thing there, you know, and they do the wheat or something like that. Uh, and Elif Shafak said, Eric Shafat said, listen to the stories beneath your feet. And as I walked on the cobblestones, push push over. Mm -hmm. Push push over because I was walking on the same stones that my mother had walked on. It was very touching, very thing for me to be able to walk on the same stones that my mother walked on. Um, so that, uh, uh, that Hussein, my friend there, like I say, he's taking me around many places. He really knows it. He loves it. He says, Harry, nobody else cares about this except me, <laughs> you know, because and some friend had taken uh, to him, and I'll tell you that story in a second. So that and I'm very honored because of being uh, friends of Haraz Din. I must tell you the number of pick-shot Turks that I have met. I'm nothing over here, okay? I'm just a businessman. I have my defense of my own thing, and so forth and so on. I'll start off with Hassan Jema, Murat Belvi. We had some drinks over at the uh, Hot Square over here. I forgot what the name of the place was. Knew his daughter here as well. Eche Temal Kuran, Baskin Ora. Ah, look at these guys are smart. They're smart. I mean, I'm smart too, but I got to better say that. Uh, Abdullah Demirbash, he is the Sur Mayor Diabakir. Beautiful person, beautiful human rights person. In his office, he has about human rights about woman. Woman. He's subjected to 274 years of jail. Why? Because he had written some stuff uh, and they had some <coughs> Armenian writing on it, you know, and so forth, like tourist things and whatnot. But, you know, he's, he's a big guy. <laughs> and that was his. Yes, we met at the uh, Akhtamar, okay, uh, when they were doing a commemoration of the church the first time in 95 years or something like that. And uh, I went up to, they said, Harry, this is the hotel room you're sleeping in. So I went upstairs and I saw there was somebody else there. I said, whoa, we've got the wrong room, you know. <laughs> it was supposed to be with him. I said, no, no, no, no, I don't sleep with anybody. <laughs> I didn't know. So, we spent four hours together. He is a member of the BPP party. And we, we stopped off going from uh, Akhtamar to Van. We went to a, a funeral. We went to a BDP meeting. We went to uh, Dua, Dua, Dua, I think it's Dua, uh, and so forth. But the thing is that, what, you know, I, the more I saw this man, and when I was in his office, and the way people came in and talked with him, he wasn't a big shot. He was the Sur Mayor of Diabekir. He was a humble person, you know? And like I say, then I saw the stuff about the women's rights and so forth. That totally impressed me. It blew me away. Halil Berktai, Halil Akshan, Elif Shafak, Osman Osman is my brother. I love him. <laughs> okay. He came to Boston, 
and he spoke at the uh, Watertown uh, Army uh, Library and so forth. And then he was going to California to speak. And I said, uh oh, those hot blooded Armenians out in California, I better go out there and make sure nothing happens to my buddy Osman. <laughs> because they're a little bit thing over there, the ones in California. But Osman, is, like I say, is just a wonderful person. And I'm going to Turkey on Monday or Tuesday. Tuesday I'll be there. And, uh, you know, I will always see Osman. Uh, he is just a wonderful person. Orhan uh, Kemal Cengiz, he came here too. He spoke at Harvard, very briefly, okay? And uh, I go to this Monarchan Cemetery a lot, you know, because it's the first garden cemetery in the United States. So uh, <laughs> it's crazy. I take people around the cemetery, visitors and so forth, because it's beautiful, it's nature. I'm a nature lover also. And so he said, Harry, can you do me a favor? Can you let me stay here for about 15 minutes and come back and get me? Because it's, it's nature and it's, you know, the trees, it's a, it's a wild bird sanctuary to begin with. The, the trees are all labeled there. It's the first garden cemetery in the United States of America. So I said, sure, because he just felt so much at ease. I've been to some of the cemeteries. I've got to tell you a story. I've been to the cemeteries in Ice City. Mm, I've got that day down. They're not so, and I like the ones over here. And, uh, and the last one that I could think of right now was Ahmed Altan. Ahmed Altan was the editor of Taraf. You know, you have to be pretty brave to write about Taraf, okay? And I just was so impressed by Taraf. He was a fearless guy. He was like a John Wayne type of thing or something of that nature, you know? And um, uh, I was up at head on James' house one time, and uh, a number of the guys were there, uh, his buddies and so forth, and, uh, and, uh, and outside were the bodyguards, okay? These guys travel around with bodyguards. I mean, it's like, wow, we, uh, these are good um, uh, Turks and so forth and so on, but there they are traveling around with bodyguards and so forth. So, I want to tell you, I, I, I'm going to get into stories now. There was a woman by the name of Lucia Janjikian. She was an elderly woman. She was from Antep. So, uh, I had known the family there. And then she uh, got married. They were living in Beirut. And she had a, then she had a big family <coughs> in Beirut from an Armenian guy she married, Pasha, Gibishe, whatever. You know, this guy had a chain and so forth and so on. And so, she was in the hospital. And so she's old and so forth now. And I went over to her and I said, Dikin uh, Lucia, Mrs. Lucia, if there is something you would want now, you've seen everything, you've lived life and so forth and so on, what is it that you would want if you had a wish? And she said, Eric, I would like to see my village. That touched me. That really touched me when she said, I would like to see my village. Okay? That's all she wanted, nothing else. Kids are all grown and so forth and so on. Another story I'll tell you, this one's going to take a little longer, and I hope I can tell it to you, right? How's my time going? You can tell it. You can tell my story? Yeah. Long story. Honey. Long story? <laughs> Medium to long. Oh, there's more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot. Uh, <laughs> oh, so, yeah. First time I was in Turkey was in 1968. Unexpectedly. Because I was going with my mother to Armenia. She was going to go visit friends of hers who were relatives of hers in, in, in Armenia uh, from Kessel. Uh, so, as it so turned out, uh, on the way going across the Atlantic, the travel agent says, Oh, by the way, Harry, you're going to have to go uh, from, from Armenia to, back up to Moscow, to Sofia, Bulgaria, to Istanbul, Turkey. Turkey? What? My brother's a genocide survivor. You want me to go to Turkey and, you know, face all that thing again? And then go to Athens, Greece. As it so turned out, it worked out okay. Okay? I just was concerned about my mother, what emotions she might feel and stuff like that. But it worked out okay. And uh, so that was the first time I was in Turkey. Then uh, the second time I went was in uh, 1985, Aradaro, Chicago. Chick uh, John, or something like that. 
And, uh, uh, but we couldn't climb our ark. Why? Because the uh, Turks and Kurds were fighting. Okay? So we couldn't climb and we came back. But I had a very interesting trip. I took a three day train trip from Vat Van all the way to Istanbul. It was very interesting. Different people that you meet. You know, then you know, the train stops, Simit Alden, Thomas Alden, <laughs> and stuff like that. You know, it's it, it, very nice. And I have great guys. The guy who bought my ticket for the train, Yatakhun Alden, a sleeping car, okay? <laughs> and uh, uh, it was just so interesting to meet these young guys and so forth. And this, uh, the, the guy I met on the ferry going from Van to Takhun, he spoke English. So he, and I told him I was Armenian, blah, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we had to go up and the, some guy said, uh, the captain of the ferry wants to see you, you know? And I said, oh, what the hell is this all about, you know? So uh, we went up and he said, oh, this guy's parents went from Turkey many years ago and so forth. So uh, uh, and I started singing. It was just a fun thing. I've been lying to the rest of the story. <laughs> I got a lot of stories to tell you, that's all. Right, let, let me just say this. I have a good time when I go to Turkey. I have a very good time. I have a lot of Turkish friends. Bizim şeyler oradadır. My roots are in Turkey. I'm not from Ireland. I'm not from South Africa. I'm a, my roots are uh, not just Turkey, but Hayseri. Okay? My roots are Hayseri. And I feel very good there, because, like I can say, because I, I, uh, whether it's the mantra, whether it's the subureg, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Merjbek Chovalata, Chovkizelder. I feel at home. But I want everybody to just kind of get along. My philosophy is, my country is the world, my countrymen are all mankind. I try to live my life that way. Okay? Because perhaps in this bill, we're all the same. Two eyes, one nose, one mouth, two ears. We're all the same. I don't know which one of you is Turkish, I don't know which one of you is uh, Afghanistanis, I don't know which one of you are Kurdish or anything like that. We're all the same. I just came from the cemetery there, beyond the way here, it's the shortcut, and I like to go through there. You all know the difference, unless you see a name. Oh, you say, oh, this one's this, this one's that. We're all the same, folks. Get along. There's a Turkish saying that young kid you talk to Istanbul. Yaldi, get yours. We came, we're going. Enjoy life. I would like to thank Harry for the standing stance. I, <laughs> I, I guess we can say. I felt sorry for the people over there. <laughs> um, I would like to um, meet for job as I'm the moderator, I think I'm going to give myself a two-minute privilege, if that's okay with you guys. As Yumi Toja was talking about his enlightenment story, I was talking about what made me realize what was going on. And I have, I have a few stories which I'm not going to tell, but there's this one, Vartini was speaking about Vatandaş Türkçe konuş, the citizens speak Turkish, uh, which was a campaign in the 50s, as she explained. But I was, as a kid, I was interested in politics when I was growing up, which is not, I don't know why, why I don't know why I did that, but I just did that. And um, when I was 10, 11, I was reading Cumhuriyet, because those were, that I thought that was the best paper back then. I don't think that anymore. Anyways, um, and then I was interested in speak. there was this movement called Öztürkçe, the uh, pure Turkish speaking, and I belonged to that. I, I tried to, I tried to speak with this pure Turkish. I used weird verbs that I don't want to use ever again, that it don't make sense, people wouldn't understand me, but I thought I had a cause. But when I was doing this, I, I used to, I, I saw this model, this citizen speak Turkish thing circulate around again, because, you know, people thought English was tainting <coughs> Turkish, or other, like globalization is tainting Turkish, Turkish is losing it. But people were curious using the citizen speak Turkish, but I'm not sure it wasn't until 2009, I think, when I read about when this model was first spoken and for what it was used for, what the purpose was. And I, it just, just hit me. It was like, oh, wait, this is why in 50s English wasn't taken Turkish. In 50s, that, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't a problem for Turkish language. They didn't want the minorities in Turkey to speak their own languages. 
And it wasn't until 2009 that I realized this, this moment that I belonged to this, this thing that I was doing tur Turkish language a favor. I didn't realize until 2009 that, that what, what I was doing, what I, what I was doing by circulating this Vatanda Shushu Komishti. So um, I think if everyone looks inside, like if you, if, you, if you learn a new thing, if you learn a new story, and if you go back, if you scrutinize your past or what you might have done or what you might have read, I think there's always room for learning more. So thank you for listening to my brief story. And now is the time, and I'd like to thank all the speakers again for, the, for their stories. And now is the time for questions and answers. And you have been raising your hand, so I'm going to go with you. First of all, I want to say that I have been here just a few months and I'm a visitor to the United States and uh, uh, I have so many illnesses and I'm 82 years old. But I want to say just one thing, that we, we live in a different age now. The past is past. We are the branches of the same tree and the leaves of the same branch. And if you look, um, it, suppose you have two gardens. In one garden, you have uh, one kind of uh, flowers, let's say, to the, And in another garden, you have many different kinds of flowers. Now, I think the garden with many different flowers looks uh, to anybody more beautiful than one kind. We should forget what has happened in the past. And uh, if we want to uh, build a new world, a united world, we, uh, God is one, man is one, and all religions are one. We are all human beings. Like I said, we are the branches of the same tree and the leaves of the same branch. We are not any different, only the uh, prejudice people have in their minds differ people. Politics differ people. Turkey is, was not the same Turkey. It was Ottoman Empire when all these things happened. Now uh, we live in a different Turkey. Turkish people, most people of to, uh, let's say about 20 years or so, were ignorant. They didn't go to school. They didn't know, like many people, but didn't know their history. They didn't know their history either. I mean, so many bad things happened on both sides, <coughs> not only uh, one side. That's all I want to say. That let's work for the betterment of our uh, unity of world. We live in such a bad time now. That, uh, I'm sorry, I have practice, and I cannot. No, it's, it's fine. Uh, Would you like to ask a question uh, as to any speaker? Or did you well, I, uh, uh, what good is it going to give people by uh, digging what has happened in the past? My English is not very good. No, it's okay. and I, I think you made your point. Would you like to respond uh, to that? Our speakers. Citizen. What is very important to the people doesn't understand the what happened to get the lesson. That's why we're gonna talk. That's no, why we're gonna dig in. We're gonna talk in. That, that's why very important. We're gonna dig in. We're gonna get the lesson. What happened? We're gonna learn, and we are not gonna be. Uh, we're gonna be stopped the happen again. That's why we're gonna dig in. Uh, we are not gonna be uh, get the. Uh, how are you going to say it? Uh, and, and uh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm quite ill. Like my yes. friends know that I had a, what you call it? Uh, yeah, I was sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. I, I appreciate your uh, good intentions and peaceful thoughts. It's, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, and for a long time. We thought that way too, but it's that this denial thing affected us in many ways in our lives, the denialism. Call it whatever you want, but the history has to be written. It was only Emin Oktai when I was in school, and it was only this school. And our identity was we were ghosts. So that's what I'm trying to tell you today, at this age now myself, and, I'm, uh, and it's not my paranoia or anything, this is the truth. I want to give one example. 
Um, uh, if you maybe let's ma make, sure that, uh, make sure that make sure that other speakers have their sure. questions too, and then in the second round of questions, mm -hmm. please hold on to that. Thank you. <coughs> so I think this may be an opportune time to say why we are here and why what happened in the past is so closely related to what's happening today. Um, there is a sign there that says Brodei Syriya Paris. I think that's because Franklin was killed and that is very much related to why people are digging to the past. We have to understand that if there was something wrong that happened in 1915, it is still happening today. So. Um, however, I know all of you, just and I do want a unit to come back, okay. um, so um, I'm gonna, I have questions for each of you which is going to have everybody thinking about things. That, that's how I see it, because I know where you're all sort of coming from. Um, uh, John, I want to ask, um, apparently you said that you came voluntarily when you came to the United States. Yeah. Now, you're dressing with a fabulous job, but at some point, maybe this witnesses, she said forced, um, migration. forced uh, migration, diaspora. So we have to clarify that. If you came here totally on your own volition, or were there certain circumstances as an Armenian living in Istanbul or Turkey um, that made you want to come to the U.S.? It's an important thing. Anlatabildim mi? Sen kendi kendine isteyerek mi geldin yoksa Ermeni olmam yüzünden senin no, hayatınız olmuyor mu? It's important. Uh, very important. No, it is uh, doesn't have any uh, pushing to do at all. I came to myself. I tell to those one because we understand. I came and how I'm, how it, uh, difficult to do my life, and then I'm gonna push to back the 1915 time. The people is gonna be uh, Syrian. They gonna pushing out and the. How miserable do they life, and then they're gonna be ignored to the uh, the government. What happened to those one? I wanted to do uh, think about it. The, the people is mind. How is gonna be think? How is gonna be difficult to the next moment? They gonna be leave to the country. They leave to the house. So everything and in the desert. Yes. Yes, but yeah. maybe you can give us an idea of what it was like when you were young, sen küçükken, Ermeni olarak orada yaşarken ne gibi güçlükler vardı, onu anlamaya çalışıyorum. Tamam. Is there an example? Ne gibi güçlükler vardı? Mesela? Kimliğim yoktu. <gülüyor> what she said, we lost, we are, yani... Eğer ben Ermeni olduğumu bilmesem Türkiye'de Ermeni varlığından haberim yoktu, kendi varlığından haberim yoktu. Ta tarihte, historide Ermeni so, so diye geçmiyor. Yeah. I would like to uh, just uh, translate this uh, conversation. I'm going to ask what, because um, John said he migrated, immigrated to the States voluntarily. Did, if he had any difficulty in his childhood that uh, drove him to that decision. And John said, I had no identity. Oh, thank you. Um, no, no, no, Can you hold on to quickly. it? Quickly. Just, I'm going to do it quickly. One more question from you, and then you have to wait for a second. Okay, well, pick, pick care, it's, a hard, it's, a hard, it's a hard choice. But anyway, um, then I will ask the, everybody here, they can who spoke. This is what I'm going to ask. In your different ways, are you still searching for some kind of closure about the Armenian genocide? And if so, how do you see that closure? What does that mean to you? What would have to happen for you to have any kind of closure? Well, I think it's not, I don't think of it as a matter of closure. I think of it as a matter of justice. It's a wrong has been done, and justice needs to be, needs to happen. So it's not a matter of closure. Um, I mean, And what would the justice look like? I'm trying to get to the specifics. It would uh, look like A, end to this denial, accept what happened, change your history books, move on to see what remedies 
can take place, whether it's in the form of return of properties, stolen properties like churches, schools, and there's still a lot of battles happening right now in Turkey legally. <laughs> Work on not being paranoid <laughs> about the Armenian say. Um, or actually there's many, I mean, just, I think it was last year or two years ago when there were protests in Turkey with people holding up signs that said, you are all Armenian, you are all bastards. And what's that message to us exactly? I mean, there's, on so many different levels, change needs to happen and justice. We need justice, that's what we need. The only thing I would, uh, I would go along with what Noah has to say, um, dialogue, this type of thing where we get to meet each other, you know, like somebody said, uh, when I was on the event, somebody, uh, she said, I've never seen an Armenian, you know, so, you know, here is it, look at me, you don't know what I look like, I'm a human being, let's treat each other as human beings, okay, and, and, and this uh, the nationalist thing, I don't know, but uh, justice and resolution. <coughs> Resolution to me is, uh, Turks have honor, so it's very difficult for Turks to turn around and say that our grandparents or great-great-parents committed genocide. That word genocide is a hang-up for Turks, okay? It's a real hang-up because they have honor within, within themselves. Somebody did. Somebody did. You want me to stand up and stand up? <laughs> okay, but that is getting longer. <laughs> uh, somebody did it. So uh, I would like to see a justice in the sense of, I know that there was a lot of property taken. Now the older I'm getting, the more I'm understanding. I feel, my feeling is, Turkish government's uh, reason for denial is uh, because of, uh, of uh, restitution. Restitution. Okay? Parader. Absinna parader. Okay? Why? Because the Turkey sees what happened to uh, Germany and Israel. Germany is still paying, folks. I mean, Germany sent over railroads and all kinds of heavy equipment and so forth to Israel. And Turkey's thing is, uh, so what they're doing, Turkey is doing, in my opinion, is that they're spending a lot of money on denialism and supposed to sit down at the table and let's talk, say nice to you. So what are you looking for? And you know, what can you give? What can you do? Let's talk. That's all. Um, Can I say just one word? I agree fully about dialogue. It's the greatest thing to do. But uh, if there is, as long as there is this denialism, many of us who are from Turkey are paranoid, actually. When they ask if they can videotape today, I was thinking, if I go back again and at the customs, because this is so much embedded inside us. You are American born and you go and have your kebabs and have your cakes and have all these uh, uh, uh, uh, intellectuals are your friends. I have also these friends, but I, as, a, as a Turkish Armenian, I have my fears. I have, my daughter calls me, I am paranoid. Yes, she's American born. But this is in us. When I was six years old, they told me not to sleep. So I spoke, I learned, I, am, I know my identity, but still. So we, the, this denial thing, as she said, the justice, has to prevail. Uh, uh, I hope there is more people than Egin Oktay now, <laughs> thanks God, that write history. So uh, uh, slowly it will evolve into understanding, and then we can have great dialogues. Uh, but it has to come from the state too. Okay, just just a following remark on what Martin has just said. We should really appreciate this this this psychology because if you keep denial, if you keep denying what happened in 1950, which is genocide. When you look at the definition of genocide in 1948, only one item just fulfills and corroborates what happened in 1950. Let put that aside. If you keep as a state, as a society, denying what happened in 1950. This psychology of being victim once more never fades away from the psychology, from the mentality of the Armenians. I'm not, I don't want to generalize this kind of explanation, but it's the case. 
standing in front of us. And actually, we should start facing with the, the or coming to terms with the dark annals, the dark pages of Turkish history, with ourselves, individually. Because this state denialism is so strong in Turkey just because of the fact that society also, there are, so, there, there are societal bases, there, are so, there is a strong societal support towards the state denial. And that's why Turkish state always, I mean, generates, produces money, financial thing, and etc. in order to consolidate and, and support its denial of policy. And, and it's a matter of material restitution as well. It's very important because the, the richness and the, the capital of the bourgeoisie in Turkey was based on the army in property, stolen army in properties, and the Greek properties as well. So it's, it's a fact, everybody knows that. That's the reason why people do not want to acknowledge Armenian genocide on the basis of uh, just receiving the claims of Armenians in order to get their properties back. So uh, it's, it's, uh, th there are all the problems, you know, obstacles, let's say, okay. standing in front of us in terms of coming to terms with our own head. Uh, I would like to, f just a friendly reminder, I've always heard that phrase and now I have the chance to say it. Every question ends with a question mark, let's just not forget <laughs> that. So it's a Q&A session, Q&A. Thank you. Uh, do you raise your hands first? I'm going to... No, yeah. No, yeah. Okay. Um, yes, thank you very much for holding this forum. I, I found it a very inspiring. Um, but one of the questions I, uh, the main question I want to ask, what does the Turkish government have to gain from acknowledging the genocide and from stopping the denial, and what do the people of Turkey have to gain? Because to me, um, you know, it's all about uh, you know the, that trade-off. You know, the, there is so much that has been gained by denial, and the longer you go, the more you know, the more costly deni um, acknowledgement is. So, what has to be gained, and, and and is there any way to work with that? Any particular addressing? Um, well, and if, if, if not, it's an open question. It's, it's really an open question. <coughs> Whoever feels that they could answer it. I'm not a psychologist, but they say the truth shall set you free. Okay, uh, that's something that I just feel that uh, once you take that burden off of you, okay, once you take that burden off of you. Turkish people will feel more comfortable within themselves. And I just feel as if they're the ones who will be the beneficiaries. I mean, the Armenians will be beneficiaries if the Turks turn around and say, yes, we're sorry that such a thing happened. And I think that part of that has got to happen uh, in universities. Universities have got to teach the fact that such a thing happened. So that it filters down into society as well. Um, for example, Baskinona came and he interviewed uh, some Armenian woman, a survivor, and she was still with it at 98 years old. She was really with it. And Baskinona wrote about her. Baskinona came to my house, interviewed my mother-in-law. Emelek, she was from Emelek, Demel. Okay? It got published in the Turkish papers. Turkish people got educated as a result of that. Or Kemal Chengiz, who wrote, writes about Armenians and so forth as well. Hassan Jamal wrote a book about it. These things were unheard of. I mean, I was an Erdogan guy in the beginning. But right now I'm so so. But anyway, I was an Erdogan. I said, look at the changes he did. You know, when I think that 17,000 Kurds have been killed and are missing, 3,000 villages destroyed, 3 million people displaced, what right does the government have to do something like that to its citizens? Wait a second, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not really the answer. Yeah. But, but I, like I say, it'll set people free. Okay? Turkey's got to enter into the world, the inter international world. The, the governments recognize what, you know, what Turkey is doing. Okay? They recognize it, whether it's France or Germany, or this one, that one, the other one. They know. But you know, Turkey will benefit, it'll grow up. It'll enter into the international community, I feel, once they uh, recognize that. So, anyone to add anything? If you want to yeah, I think uh, the, the most important game will be for Turkey to, to, to, to have more democratic system and more democracy. And 
acknowledging and or resolving that this uh, intricate conflict between Turkey and Armenia or the acknowledged recognition of Armenian genocide would directly reflect upon the consolidation and the flourishing of Turkish democracy and it directly reflects upon the resolution and disentanglement of Kurdish question in Turkey as well. Now we are going through the problems of the, the post-genocidal society, traumatic problems actually. Uh, since we just, we are not able to come to face with that, you know, and we cannot change our educational system, we cannot change the history books, and we cannot change all this Milli Talim Terbiyefi, and so on and so forth. That's why Turkey should be more democratic, and also Turkey is trying to be a full member of, full me trying to gain the full membership of European Union. When you look at the the, the, the, uh, what's going on in European Union, they are trying to carve out, they are trying to constitute a, a kind of general tendency against the racism, against all these, gen I mean, the, the genocidal acts and atrocities uh, of the countries whom, you know, whom cannot or whom has not still, has not yet recognized, has not yet come to terms with that. That's why also Turkey, <coughs> there is also foreign pressure, an outside pressure, coming from you know European Union towards Turkey. We, we, we have seen this the, the same thing when the Fre uh, French government, the Sarkozy government was trying to uh, promulgate this law which uh, punished the, the denial of genocide, Armenian genocide in France. It, this kind of particular thing does not only concern the France, actually European Union, the countries, the full members of European Union are trying to constitute that kind of law actually within the European Union so uh, with this this also uh, also you know contributes to improvement of democracy in Turkey uh, one of the speakers mentioned that something needs to come up from the state um, so when you look at the current administration or the Turkish parliament uh, do you really see any hope uh, to improve the dialogue between the people. Sorry. So, uh, one of the speakers mentioned that something needs to come up from the state so that like two people can start communicating with each other. Um, I'm just wondering, when you look at the Turkish administration right now, or Turkish parliament, do you see any hope for that to happen? In the current state of things, there's no I mean, a hundred years is a really long time for yeah. justice to be uh, established. Yeah, and so, I mean, when we look at Turkey right now, the only hope that as youth we have is the Gizi protests, for example. Uh, but we don't know what it will be able to change like 20 years from now or 30 years from now. So, I was just wondering your thoughts about that. Well, I mean, I think in the past, you know, 10 or so years, I mean, we've seen some changes in Turkey and we've seen people speaking up about these issues and I think that's where it starts. It starts with people talking about journalists and writers and activists speaking up and that's how things can change and how that's how the narrative coming from Turkey can change and eventually it can reach the top, I think. Um, I don't know how long it will take. Um, I don't know what practical considerations need to play into. I mean, um, but I think we are seeing also some uh, change happening on more of a government level, uh, coming from the uh, other parties like the BDP, for instance, and you know the Arabic and stuff. There's uh, some efforts there, and. So I think things are changing. I don't know how fast that can be. Ben şunu söyleyebilirim. Yani hiçbir hükümet, hiçbir şey eğer halkın ona karşı bir hareket olmadığı sürece kolay kolay kabul edilir. Yani hükümete bu olayı kabul ettirecek olan halkın kendisi. Halkı eğer bilinçlendirecek olursa, onun için tüm tarihi sildi, Ermeniyelerin varlığını sildi ki öğrenmesin. Öğrenmediği zaman var olan kötü bir şeyi 
insan bilmediği zaman ona karşı bir mücadele edemeyecek. Onun için tüm tarihi sildi. Onun için harf devrimini yaptı 1928'de Türkiye Cumhuriyeti. Osmanlı'dan Latin alfabesine döndü. Tarihi silmek, yeniden yazmak için. Eğer halk, işte onun için bu toplantılar yapılıyor ki insanlar bilinçlensin hükümetine yapmış olduğum yanlıştır. Hükümeti değiştirecek olan, itecek olan, kabul ettirecek olan insanların ona e, karşı vereceği mücadeledir. Onun haricinde hükümet kolay kolay şey yapmaz. Onun işine gelir insanlar birbirine düşürüp, birbirine kırdı kırdırma. Kürt'ü, Türkiye, Alevi, Sunni'ye, Ermeni, e, Türkiye işine gelir. Çünkü sistem o şekilde yürür. Yani halk, sokaktaki insan birbirlerine çalışırken onun sistemi devam eder. Çünkü düşünmez bizim halimiz ne oluyor? 3000 yıllık bir Türkiye, Osmanlı geleneği var. Üçüncü Dünya ülkesi durumunda Türkiye'nin ekonomik durumu yani. Düşün ki İkinci Dünya Savaşı'nda yok olup çıkan Almanya bugün en, en güçlü ekonomilerde bir tanesine sahip. Yani bu yönde düşünmek lazım. Halkı bu yüzden bilgilendirmek lazım ki e, şey yapsın. E, hükümetini e, şey yapsın. İyi yönde e, motive et. Rahatsız <gülüyor> oldu. <gülüyor> reverse its course of a denial if it just so happens to work for it. Um, and it's the responsibility of the people to push their own governments to recognize such atrocities of the past. And so, and this is precisely why the Turkish state is always, you know, diffusing um, or um, obfuscating historical uh, enterprises and using different minority groups, Kurds against Armenians, Armenians against Syrians, whatever works for the longevity of the state, it just so happens to be, you know, um, preventing people from gathering in public spaces and like, forming some kind of collective consciousness. And this is why it's important to get it. I saw your hands first. Um, yes, I appreciate this conversation a great deal. And I, I have a question about how much you all think there is value in recognizing similarities and differences amongst the various genocides over the past century. And I say this because last Sunday at the Babson University um, event commemorating the 20th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide against the Tutsis, um, a colleague of mine spoke about the Jewish Holocaust. I spoke briefly about the Armenian Genocide. And in this remarkable conversation among the Rwandans about how a genocide denial anywhere is of importance to all, anyone who cares about genocide anywhere in the world. And I learned slightly before that from a physician colleague friend who runs a clinic for women and children in Kigali that the memorial in Rwanda uh, to the Rwandan genocide, it's a museum, has a special room that is dedicated to other genocides. And so there's material about what happened to Bosnians, Cambodians, Armenians, Jews. And they believe very deeply that one cannot talk about one's own genocide in isolation, that you have to really weave it in with the um, theme of you know, human beings and humanity to other human beings across the globe. And they believe it also has some effect in helping governments get past the geopolitical realities to creating a moral truth and recognition that keeps away at our very soul until we get past it. And I was very moved by their conversation. Someone from the Rwandan embassy was there, and also about their discourse. And I just want to mention that at the Harvard um, Kennedy School, this next Sunday from 6 to 8, there is a, re a remembrance that I think the focus is on the Rwandan, Armenian, and Jewish Holocaust, but it's in that sort of theme of let's make sure we don't see one genocide as terribly unique. And even denial is occurring everywhere, even in Cambodia. Um, the Armenians are not unique in struggling with denialism from the government itself. Um, it's, it's, it still exists in other places as well. The basic question was, do you see any resemblances? 
uh, for um, I was I have been preparing for my comprehensive exam before I became PhD mm -hmm. candidate, and one of my topic was the comparison between the confiscation of our main properties and the organization of the Jewish properties during the Nazi regime, and I was focusing on and I was just uh, trying to understand the so-called abandoned properties laws and series of law status and, and the degrees, communics promulgated during the CUP era and also revised and reformed and kept promulgated during the Republican period as well. And I was trying to make comparison between two cases and I saw the very distinct resemblance between the organization and the formation of liquidation commissions Abandoned Properties Commissions between the CUP case and the Republican, Republican case and the Nazi, Nazi regime. And in terms of functionaries, in terms of the duties of the functionaries which used to work in those two commissions, Liquidation and Abandoned Properties Commissions. For instance, German, the Nazis name it as trustee commissions, the CUP guys or the Republican guys name it as Liquidation Commissions on the Abandoned Properties Commission. So, in terms of the confiscation or the plundering of uh, uh, properties, I can I, I would argue a concrete resemblance and the similarities convergences between the Nazi case and the uh, and the confiscation of our main properties case. We can all make we can always make comparison. This discussion, the uniqueness or the unprecedented say of the Holocaust is, is, is always a discussion. Now the scholar the genocide scholarship is just trying to find out the comparison between uh, among the genocide actually. So, rather than also the theme of yeah. Turks who saved the lives of Armenians, <laughs> Serbians who saved the lives of Bosnians. Dr. Svetlana Bros wrote a whole book about that called Good People in an Evil yes, Time. Yes, you can just given a big award I'm, here. But most of the world doesn't recognize these amazing stories of brave people. Civil courage is what Dr. Bros refers to it as. Mm -hmm. Can I just say one thing? I'd like to uh, reflect on the question you had asked earlier about the um, I gave you a list of all these big shot terms that I know. Well, I know some guys that are <laughs> not so big shots. And, um, and uh, they said to me, and these guys had spent some years in jail and so forth because of their leftist activities. And they said, Harry, it can happen again. It can happen again. A genocide of Armenians can happen again in Turkey. That's why I think it's important for the government, okay, to educate the people as to what has happened, and it was wrong. Just as Germany, you know, they set up monuments, museums, and so forth, insofar as what happened in the Holocaust. Somewhere along the line, I expect that the government of Turkey has got to bring forth this kind of thing and recognize that it happened and that it should not happen. It's a shame. Atatürk said, it's a shameful act, okay? How would you like it if somebody came to you in your house and they said to you, get out, you, know, you gotta go, and so forth. It's not fair to, and the government did this. The government did this. So, like I said, this is what some of my Turkish friends had said, that it could happen again. And that's the thing that kind of worries me, that because, and Haran said, Turkish people don't know so they have to be educated about what it happened. Um, third, you raise your hand there. Okay, you first, and then you, and then you, and then you. <laughs> you know, you know yourself. Yeah, um, so a couple of years ago, uh, there was this uh, campaign, like from some intellectuals and academics, called like the "I'm Sorry" uh, Uzbekistan campaign. So as far as I know, there was like mixed reception from like uh, Armenian community. I was wondering uh, what you thought about that, and what would be like your advice to sort of civil society on like how to improve those sort of efforts and what was missing. The campaign was, I think, was spearheaded by Bas Knoran and Father Özgür, and it, the text basically said. I apologize for the terrible thing that, because they use the term Medziega, if I'm saying that, yeah, yeah they, the great uh, Kalam. Kalam. they use that term, they avoided the use of genocide, and they say, we apologize, we, I, we apologize, 
the, those who signed this document apologize for what happened in 1915, but that was the whole text, it was just a free paragraph. So that's the document you're referring to. Yeah. Uh, only in the name I was wondering what your thoughts uh, so yani kişisel düşün, niçin o çok önemli? Türkiye insanının konuşuyor olması, özür dilemesi hiç önemli değil. Yani o şeyin, e, aktivitenin başlaması, insanların konuşması için bir başlangıç olduğu için, konuşuyor olmalarına ön ayak açtığı için çok çok önemli. Onun haricinde, yani gerçekten özür dilese de dilemese de, şey değil ama insanlar için konuşuyor olması, bu konunun gündeme gelme, getirmesi açısından çok çok önemsenecek bir olay olarak görüyorum ben. Yoksa içerinin ne olması çok daha öne önemli değil yani ne olmuş ne olmuş ne olmamış. Ama o konuyu gündeme getirip de insanların tartışıyor etmesi tüm televizyonlarda şunda bunda böyle bir e, olay var. Taksim'de 24 Mayıs anılıyor olmasının konuşulması insanların gündemine girmesi önemsenecek bir şey ve desteklenmesi gereken bir şey. Uh, I see this effort very very important but more in so far as it is just a conversation starter. The contents of that letter is not that important in my opinion. Uh, but I do think that it was very very important because it brought to the fore this conversation this topic it you know took up some media space and started a conversation. So in that sense, I think it was very important. Can I just respond if no one else is going to say something? Because I know exactly what the woman, is, young woman is asking, which is a little bit different than what you're, you're basically asking that the reception was a little different within the Armenian community in the U.S. as a whole. There was a Oh, yeah, exactly. by, uh, the lecture by from NYU that actually explained some of the problems that were raised by some of the Armenian communities. And it's basically one is because they did not find the agency through which this or apology was yeah, going to happen. Okay, right. and the I second really is because they thought it. that they should have been the Turkish people. It was a small cadre of people in Turkey, intellectual that they should have actually consulted with certain Armenian colleagues or, you know, brethren to figure out what it is it should be in that piece of text. I think it's that, can I say something? I think it's that a dialogue. One of the things that I would like to see happen within the Armenian community is for the Armenian community to honor those Turks who saved Armenians. Many of them, and I think some that died as a result, were killed as a result of saving Armenians. I have one friend, and she wrote a book about uh, some of that stuff about uh, personal s situations, you know, you know, individual family things where uh, Turks had saved Armenians. But on uh, Allah, there were Arras who controlled villages, uh, village, uh, cities, and so forth, and they had saved many Armenians. And I, I encourage Armenians. <coughs> to write about that. You know, they, they had the Schindler's List thing that was very popular. And I think that, like I say, there were many Turks that did save Armenians, and Armenians have an obligation to write about that. So the Turks will know that they, these, these Turkish gentlemen stuck their necks out to save uh, Armenians. Tied up to the original question. Um, so your reception, to, do you, what do you think of this apology? Uh, I think anything in that direction is good okay. because it brings dialogue somewhere along the line. Thanks. Um, this starts sweater. Yes. My question um, is tying back to psychology, especially hearing some of the comments and questions I hear today. Even if a uh, Turkish government or Turkish society doesn't want to view this as a humanitarian cause for another group of people, Armenians, what will it take for them to understand that? Uh, a strong nation is one that can come to terms with its past and be able to accept that it has mistakes. There's no such thing as a flawless group of people. What will it take for him to you know, cast aside this cowardice and this weakness and realize that it takes strength to come forward and give these discussions? And realize that Armenians want to have open dialogue but with a strong nation, a nation that's willing to come forward, not a nation that's willing to sit down and the first words out of their mouth is denialism. What do you think it would take to have these 
alter that psychology from Turkish nationalists or denialists? Uh, one of my Turkish friends said, how do you go ahead and change the psychology of a people for all these years they've been told that there was no such thing that happened, like a genocide? It takes a lot. And that's where you've got to get certain professionals, professionals, like just last week, uh, some guy from New Zealand who was head of the United Nations something or other apologized after 20 years because of the situation I believe it was in Rwanda. Okay? Uh, that's one example. Uh, and there are other examples like that where government, it can't just be an individual that says I'm sorry. It's got to be on the part of a government. It's got to be a responsible individual uh, in the government that has got to, to apologize. Um, there was something else too, but I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I mean, Turkey, you know this, obviously, but Turkey is um, is very um, reluctant in allowing even its citizens to talk about things that make the country or the nation seem weak or, you know, there was that famous, infamous law, the law one, I mean 301, that has to do with insulting Turkishness. And Turkishness I mean, is not defined in that law in any language, it's just a great concept. And I mean, Haram Singh was trying that law. Uh, there's been, I mean, so many instances of journalists and writers, you know, being harassed, being imprisoned because of this law. And it really holds Turkey back. I mean, it has. And I think that's a psychology that's really hard to break out of. Like, and like, look at, I mean, Vartani is here and she's paranoid about talking about certain things, wondering if when she goes back to Turkey, they're going to catch her at customs and if <laughs> second round if there is because there are a lot of people who want to ask questions so we'd like to respect it to everyone um yes uh, I like to join the lady in the front and the back also that's something to their comment uh, what happened uh, in our past is really terrible uh, being a Turkish. I think we don't deny that. But uh, when you look at the history, there is always two sides of the story. Here, uh, today, I'm happy to hear the Armenian side of the stories. But uh, like uh, Unit mentioned, the uh, likely 1915 war between uh, Ottomans and uh, uh, you know, Russians, uh, where Armenians were together against Ottomans. So what happened that when we lost the war, and uh, after 1915, of course, uh, it resulted that the huge mistake. In my belief, if there was another way to just punish whoever was against Ottoman at that, at that time, not to have this tragedy, right now, if we will have all these Armenian citizen in Anatolia, I think Anatolia will be a better place to live right now. Because uh, I know lots of good Armenian people, uh, you know, I get to meet uh, how, uh, you know, organized and hard work people are. Uh, now, um, when we think about just the same apologies, uh, you know, for Turkish side, if the Armenian people can accept that, I think all the Turkish people are ready to push our government to say, yes, you know what, you made a big mistake, and this should never happen, just forget it, let's he have this healing time. But when I look at this, uh, like I said, like para, the money side, the part bothers me most, uh, every time when we have elections in America, last 20, uh, four years I was kind of following, I will see that American senators kind of scratch this uh, painful past and uh, trying to gain 
uh, some kind of economical, you know, uh, result from the Armenian people. So then we are talking about hundred years ago what Turkish people made, what Turkish government's mistake. But when we look at it today, what is happening in Israel? I mean, then we need to think about how we are going to call that. Is this genocide? Is this war between uh, Palestinians and Israeli people? And even I think I'm going to ask this question to you <coughs> since you are comparing this as a uh, you know German Jewish uh, like way. How do you compare this then? Uh, you know. Like what was going on right now, today, what we have, and also how uh, we can just give it back what Armenian lost in Turkey. I mean, how is that possible? Like returning the all the property. property. <coughs> As regards the comparison between the Holocaust case and the and Armenian genocide, for instance, in uh, the, the deportations, as I said before, deportations got started on, in, in February and March in the Cilician region. I mean, and there was no deportation even in the, the six provinces, which supposedly speaking, the Armenians were siding with the Russian or the Tsarist Russia. Okay, there was no deportation in, in, the, in, the, in that region, but in May. Before, in May, they just came up with all these abandoned properties laws. And those abandoned properties laws applied to deported Armenians, or the not deported Armenians, the deported Ottoman citizens or Ottoman subjects. So why did you just prepare a number of a series of laws to confiscate the properties of your own subject citizens, which you wanted to settle down in a different, in a local, different place? Why did you settle, so-called settle, your own Ottoman citizens into an area the way in which, four years ago, you sent two urban planners to this region, Syrian region, in order to check whether or not I can send the refugees, my, you know, refugees coming from the Caucasus and the Balkan region into this area. Talat Pasha himself sent two urban planners right after the of the Balkan war to Syria, the Azor region especially the Azor region, in order to check whether or not the places in this region were conducive to, to settle the refugees coming from, as, as flocks, you know, coming from the Balkan regions and the Caucasian regions. And according to the result of these two urban planners, there was no place here for make, doing agriculture, for seeding, no water and everything, nothing. But you sent your own citizens to those deserted areas, to those regions. So, we should just, and before the deportation, you applied those abandoned properties laws, and you stipulated that deported citizens are supposed to have that amount of money, that amount of jewelry, that amount of items, that amount of material, material kind of stuff. That, and you can even leave those people to bribe gendarmeries or to bribe the officers during the deportation. So deportation itself, I mean, sh I mean itself should be understood in, in, in, in a proper way. I mean, if you went to see the genocidal intent of the CUP, Union of Progress Party, or the Committee of the Union of Progress Party, you should look at the content of the deportation. When they applied the abandoned properties laws to deported Armenians, only the deported Armenians or the deported Ottoman Christian subject to citizens, they thought right after the deportation, Armenians, Armenians were not managed to survive all these throughout the, throughout the, throughout the, uh, these uh, deportation laws. That's why they came up with the abandoned properties laws. Right in September 1915, they established liquidation commissions. Just for just for for the purpose of liquidating Armenian properties. Why did you li liquidate your own subject, uh, your own citizen properties? You know, if you had to settle them uh, in a different place, in a different area, different location. <coughs> and conversion of all these orphanages, orphanage uh, establishment of orphanages, conversion of Armenian women 
and, and conversion of Armenian children, Turkification of all these children as well. For instance, Ottoman government was encouraging and adopting of Armenian children for the Muslim families by paying them monthly salary because there was no room for Armenian children in the orphanages. That's why they applied that kind of policy. So there is a lot to talk about regarding the whole uh, genocidal scheme of the Union and Progress Party. This, and also, there were some governors who were opposed to deportation decisions. And two of them were killed by the government, by the secret order of Talat. Are, are you saying that because of this reason, Armenian people are kind of stuck together uh, with Russia and then... I mean, for instance, that? In, let's, let's, let's, let's take the case of my own study. I'm working on Aintab Armenians okay. in 19... I mean, Aintab Armenians didn't side with Russia. Zaris Russia. You are talking... I mean, within the, within the Russian army, during the one uprising of the Armenians in, in, in, in one, in Russian army, there was a Caucasian battalion, and all this Caucasian battalion was composed of Armenian soldiers who had Russian citizenship. They were Russian Armenians. They were not Ottoman Armenians. There were Ottoman Armenians in this battalion, but those Armenians were fled from the massacres of Abdulhamid period in 1895 and 1896. They, they, they, they ran away from uh, Anatolia, they ran away from Erzurum, Harpet, and they ended up being in Russia, and they acquired Russian citizens, and they uh, went to the Russian army, because they want to take revenge. Okay, so you are saying that in, in uh, Anatolia at that time, no Armenians killed any Turkish people? They, they killed, uh, I mean, of course, there were skirmishes between two communities, but what happened to Armenians is not comparable to what happened, to what, what Armenians, uh, what Armenians did, Right after, I mean, after 1916 and 1917, when the Russian army invaded Doğu Beyazıt, Erzurum, Erzincan, Armenians, and the, in the Caucasian battalions, Armenian soldiers killed Muslim people. 45,000 Muslim people were killed by Armenians. But they were revengeful activities of Armenians. Just to stop the back and forth, thank you for the question and the answer. Um, we should not forget, we should not forget who the agents, who the actors are. Uh, the, like, this killed that versus the state organized something and state killed. Like, th this is, there are two ma major different concepts. Like, it's not apples and oranges, but it's maybe apples and you know, another fruit that's really good. Yeah. Like, we should not, the actor and the acted upon are important parts of that you're making comparison. Like, we should not forget that. Everybody. But of course, you have a point because it was a psychology. Yeah, of I the try to understand. No, I understand you pretty well. Yeah. It was the psychology of the organizers of all these, all these deportations, actually. Because they thought the same kind of... Up, because uh, there was not only up, uh, uprising in one, there was uprising in Urfa, there was uprising in Shevin Karaysa, but those people were trying to defend themselves. Because they were subject and they, they had enough experiences to be exposed to massacres and atrocities because of 1895 and 96 massacres, 99 massacres in Adana, it didn't take place only in Adana, it took place in Osmania, in Silesia, in Dörtgöl, in Aintab, in Maraş, and everywhere. And Armenians start arming themselves. That's quite normal. <laughs> you are living in it, the, I mean, the horrible conditions. I mean, and there were also, the, uh, of course, Armenian females, uh, we are talking about community who also acquired the nationality, national identity, who established their own political organizations and political communities, it's quite normal. We are, I mean, we are talking about a multi-confessional empire. I would say another interesting topic might be to research upon is the Jewish uh, guerrilla fight, not guerrilla fighter, but during the Holocaust there were armed Jewish groups who fought and who defended their communities as well. So you can, like, I think the proper comparison would be that, uh, but not the state's action versus the citizen's action. I think that was it. Uh, no, the gentleman in the white shirt. And the... <coughs> well, the lady on the front uh, already left. I was planning to make a point regarding that and ask a question, but I, I assume that the lady here seconds her, some of her views. In regards to the destruction of history, I don't think we should simply say uh, 
we shouldn't overlook the idea of, okay, we should forget the past and move on. Let's accept the fact that there are good Armenians, bad Armenians, bad Turks, good Turks, good Americans, bad Americans. But apart from that, the reason why I think history is so much so important. I mean, Friedrich Nietzsche, the great philosopher, even argues that the destruction of history would create a, a harmonious, functioning society. But that reality is actually, that idea, that notion is actually false. The reason why is because history is created by human beings. And unless we learn from the mistakes of our past, we can't revert the mistakes that we will make in the future. And uh, one example, I'm Syrian-Armenian, and uh, I think one example that I can even bring up that happened more recently in the past three, four weeks is the following. Uh, there's no way that we can even compare what happened in 1915 to the events in Kesab, Syria. Only one, one individual was killed in Kesab, and he was an armed soldier who was defending his own city. But Kesab was traditionally an Armenian village that has been Armenian for the past six, seven centuries since the Kingdom of Bilikia. But in my perspective, if the government of Turkey had accepted the mistake of its past, it would have never allowed jihadist Al-Qaeda affiliated organizations to gain access to the lands in Syria, to Kesab in Syria. And that's the key about history and learning from history. Kesab was by no means anywhere comparable to the genocide. No one person was killed, he was an armed soldier. But, the, but there are very similar, similar situations in terms of Kesab and what happened in 1915, in the sense that a traditionally Armenian village, a historically Armenian village, was completely deported. It was forcibly deported. And I've spoken to a lot of the victims from the Kesab deportation, and the one thing that they said was, you know what, it was probably what happened in 1915. The, the only difference was we didn't have caravans to, to actually move to Latakia. We actually had cars instead. And, and I think the reason why we have to accept our past uh, is so that we don't repeat the mistakes in the future. It wasn't a Q&A. <laughs> the, the, the question is, what did really happen in 1915? Okay. <laughs> That's the question. Okay. That was a good, you used a good tool for my appreciation. Now I'm aware. Okay, you and then. Just, just, I actually, I, I asked three questions. Maybe I didn't do just question mark. No, no, no. Uh, so, second uh, round. Has to be second round. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, I mean, I mean, have a mentality that despite whatever Turk you meet, they demand that they immediately post haste, uh, find out about the history and apologize to the genocide. No matter if that Armenian had an ancestor who committed genocide or not, it doesn't matter. Hanan Dink said, without the Democratic Republic of Turkey, there would be no genocide record. As the situation in Turkey right now, there's a lot of protests for democracy, and I feel personally, Armenians here have pretty much ignored all that. My question, I guess, to Umit, I think, um, would be, what do you expect from us? What do you demand from the Armenian community in regards to trying to democratize uh, Turkey? I guess the Armenian community in America, or Armenian community outside of Turkey, Armenian community outside of Armenia. What do you expect from them? What do you demand from them in your struggle for democracy? No, I mean, uh when we when when you say when we say Turkish community, I mean we are not talking about a homogeneous sort of community. When you say the same for Armenia and Turkey, it's the same situation. So there are nationalist groups within the Armenian community as well. They are you know the the dolls and the hogs, you know, within the same society. So maybe the Armenians or the the mod, let's say the moderate Armenians and the Armenians who are more conducive to dialogue and the conversation. With, this, with, the, with the other side can appease or put those, you know, the harsh or the radical, radically oriented are the, the section of Armenian society at ease in that way. So, and also, uh, I think this, we, we should really discuss the matters together and we, and we should really make a reality check. If, <laughs> unless, I mean, unless we read the history from the from the various uh, from various sources, 
I mean, unless, or we just, you know, uh, we just move with our uh, prejudices, we cannot just, you know, come to any consideration, any, any positive consideration and analysis with respect to the whole, the whole of, I mean, the tra trajectory of the historical events. So I think we should acquire knowledge first and foremost. For instance, uh, you said that, I mean, Armenians sided with the, the, the, the Tsarist Russia and etc. I mean, this is, not, this is not the case for the whole Armenian and Anatolia. You know? So, and we should also look at the site, we should also understand, I mean, I'm not, I mean, this does not also excuse or legitimize what the, what the, what the Talat and Ver Jamal or the, you know, Dr. Nazim or Bahatin Shakir did, but we should really understand the psychology of those guys. They were governing, they were governing and they were running the country and the empire and their sole aim was to save this empire. And they had this social Darwinist mentality, they had this positivist mentality, they had, they were so inspired with the Gabinel, who was the main founder of this mass psychology kind of thing, the fascism, Mussolini and the Hitler were, were so <coughs> impressed by this Gabinel guy. And the CEP guys were through the main followers of this kind of intellectuals for instance. So, for instance, we are talking about what happened in, on 24th of April 1915, and the, Turkey, uh, the Turkish government is uh, now getting prepared for commemoration of the anniversary of the war and the big war, the big resistance in Gallipoli. When, when, the, when the, arrest, the decision to arrest the Armenian intellectuals, first and foremost in Istanbul, and, and then other cities and the provinces in Anatolia, uh, were on its way. There were also attacks from the British and the front British forces and the French forces in Gallipoli, and these guys were so afraid of being invaded and being bombed by these sources from Gallipoli, and they were so afraid of losing Istanbul even at that time. Within this psychology, within this feeling compressed, feeling insecure, they also, you know, opted for applying that sort of policy toward on Armenian or against Armenian. So we are talking about a, a, a, a politicians, you know, who were responsible for running this country, running the empire, saving the empire, and they, we Armenians, you know, as the most dangerous kind of political entity against the, you know, the, the well-being or the, or the presence of Armenians, and they opted for applying that sort of policy on Armenian. Any violation, extermination. For the Kurds, assimilation, for instance. For the Arabs, for the Albanians, Armenians were not the only Ottoman citizens to be deported. Turks were also deported, Kurds were deported, Arabs were deported, Assyrians were deported, because it was a whole policy of homogenization, Turkification of Anatolia. It was a whole policy of <coughs> ethnic engineering, social engineering policy. And Armenian and the policy which was applied on Armenians, were unfortunately uprooting and the decimating of this specific community, this specific ethnic or religious community as given. So, I mean, yes, we should take into consideration the historical context very carefully and then make our analysis or consideration accordingly, of course. Okay, second round, then. Gonja, you have your questions no. Do you mind if I want I want to read something that is like for the public opinion? People who don't have the time or energy to go read the genocide convention. I'm going. I want to read something because it would clarify for some people in the room. Okay. You want to as read far a passage as from the genocide convention. Yeah, it's not from that, but this is public opinion. What in U.S. when you ask public opinion, what they understand is genocide, and that's why they will go out and you know, a photo commemoration, whether it's for Rwanda or Sudan or Armenian genocide or the Jewish Holocaust, okay? It is the killing of innocent civilians from a particular group in order to defeat an armed rebellion by some members of that racial group. Should I read that again? Because that basically means that if you have a bunch of Armenians somewhere in the Ottoman Empire who were actually getting arms, to fight against the Ottoman Empire, okay? They were there, and the state or the government, whatever you want to call it at the time, actually got together and had this mentality and went after 
the people from that racial group, whether they were children or what, or innocent or whatever, that actually does constitute genocide. I just have to say it, because I think that is the simplest way to make people understand that the fact that Armenians were armed, some of them, does not mean that that was not genocide would happen to them. Um, I wanted to ask you, I'm sorry, we need to talk a lot, but you know, history is important. You stopped after the, um, um, you know, that you said when you were explaining history, how uh, the Turkish state in 19, whatever, I forgot the date now, that they actually prosecuted the CUP. People, in 1990. Right? 90. So, what happened, I know it's a very long story, but as, as far as uh, internationally, okay, why is it, what happened in that interim between 1919 and later until we came to, a, to this point where we still have genocide denial in Turkey? What happened? Internationally. <clears throat> Internationally, those, all these court verdicts were regarded as null and void for the Kemalist forces who were fighting against, against the allied powers within Anatolia, actually. It was the following. Uh, after the after, after matter of the Mondoros armistice, actually, there was a deal between the allied forces and the Kemalist forces because Anatolia was going was was supposed to be left to left to the you know Turks, but right but two two months after Istanbul was invaded by the Allied forces by the British and the French forces and Cilicia was invaded as opposed to Mondoros armistice actually. So what I'm trying to point out is that the the Turks were quite satisfied with the Mondor the the, the boundaries uh, stipulated and coined within this this armistice. But the Allies forces infringe upon this armistice, the, the articles of the armistice, by using the seventh article of Mondoros, this infamous seventh, seventh article. Before that, for instance, the Kemalist forces were growing up in Ankara, and then there were some dealings between the Kemalist forces and the British forces in terms of prosecuting the Ittihad, Ittihadist guys, because Mustafa Kemal did not want those guys to get involved in his own movement because he he just he had to make a separation between his own movement uh, from the from the from the Ittihadist movement. That's why he always you know wanted Amir Pasha away from Istan, away from Anatolia. So this this and the Mustafa Kemal was very close to prosecute all these guys. That's why he made such speech around that time. This, uh, I mean, in his own newspaper, Minbat, the way in which he just promulgated new, this newspaper with Fetokia, in this newspaper, he made this speech, he coined Armenian genocide as shameful act, you know, and within, within one of his anonymous, un, un, you know, uh, unauthorized uh, articles, he even uh, talked about the whole genocidal process. And he just condemned them, and many times. Aside this, you know, this speech, uh, this this uh, shameful act. So, the interest of the great powers, interest of the great powers, in in summary, just just just a bit. We can talk talk about it, you know for a day. But interest of great power, interest of France, interest of British Empire, when they got involved in in the in the you know landscape, and then the whole decisions, whole verdicts of the courts were just regarded as null and void. That's the reason why British Empire released the prisoners from Malta in exchange of releasing the captive soldiers, the high officers of uh, British Empire. It was its problem. Also speaking of definitions, um, Turkish Penal Code Clause 76 also defines genocide as a crime. Like it's def genocide is defined in Turkish law. That there is also that. Like if you want to go check it out, just throw it at you. Um, second round? I, I have two quick questions to the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think so. We have to talk over it too. Uh, yeah, I'll talk to the master. Our speakers are unfortunately really tired and exhausted. Uh, oh, so, uh, this is great. Come on. But, oh. <laughs> Thank
like not online talks, but these are real people. So like you can exchange uh, communication information and then you can talk. But I think formally, I think they're done. Right. Thank you all right. for coming right. again. I just uh, want to make an announcement since the audience oh. is interested in this question. Uh, the MIT Armenian Society has uh, invited Tan Rachan to speak next week on Friday, April 25th at 4 p.m. If you have your email put on uh, Emra's list, I can definitely email out to you. And the discussion, his talk, is going to be on why do Turks deny the Armenian genocide. So I welcome everyone to come uh, see his uh, talk. Thank you for being on the I want to thank Boston Bull for putting yes. this on. Yeah. Thank you.